Oh, what a sentence. <laughs> I'm just I'm blown away by these fucking ads from the 70s. No. They go in. It's like big dick energy. They're like, we are the fucking best. And then it's just like fat. Get, get, get up on the get mic, on mic, man. Dude, come on. They fucking hit you. Get up on the mic. The beautiful Bring facts. the heat. Watch the glass with the I mic know. people. I know. I'm having a I'm having a hard time being unable to answer when people ask me to send them in the direction of good information on engineering. Mm. I'm having a real hard time with it because my first response is a, a, a deep and long hesitation to the text. I usually don't respond right away no matter who they are. Um, and I don't... I reluctantly say there's probably a few good mixed with the masters. There's probably a few good of everything. I mean, you can find things, but there's no single place that I feel confident sending an up-and-coming engineer um, for good to decent information. There's, um, does anybody? I mean, have you? Not even close. Not even no. close, right? And there's, no. there's, there's nothing curated with a, with a set of values that that we would in any way resonate with. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering how you would define good information. Useful. Useful. Uh, something that I feel like I could learn from because mm. I'm not going to pass on to mm. information to someone that I don't feel like I can learn from because I want to constantly learn and I feel like I, I'm trying to, you know, we discussed this at one of the live conversations events that I brought up. Like I'm inspired by new and young engineer peers and um, of mine. I, I'm not really inspired by a lot of the, um, the big mixer mixes right now. I don't put them on and, and think back to, like when I think about um, when I heard Usher's Climax by Manny, like when we were in Tony's room one night, uh, I think I was with you when we we, yeah. we listened together. It was yeah. on it was on the Tenoys too, and I hate those speakers, but you could just tell that that was a, a, a very carefully thought through mix. Like everything was really precise and clean and enough vibe. And it was, it was pristine. It was so pristine. Yeah. It was just so inspiring. And honestly, yes. I bring that up at this conversation because it's the last time I felt that way. Um, <laughs> yeah. It is. The, it is. It's the last time I, I said, on a new, whoa. Of a new record. Of a new yeah, record. Yeah. Of a new record. The, hmm. the Something that I think about with these, you know, with all the engineers, just whatever, generically, is that when they give advice, they fall into two modes. One is, so they're on a journey. And they're, you know, they came from one place and they're, they're in the place of success, right? Let's just frame it that way. And they give advice like they lead with, well, what you need to do is get an antelope clock. Right. And it's like, I imagine someone on a journey, they've walked from Oregon to LA. And as they come down, you know, Alameda, they're saying, what you need to do is get these shoes because they're the comfiest trainers I've ever worn. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that's, that's not how you got here. That's, that has nothing to do with how you got here. And then on the other side, they do this thing where they, which we talked about, I think in week one, is they tell these sort of uh, stories about, about hustle and triumph and, mm -hmm. uh, and adversity and being abused yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and these kind of um, self-elevating stories about their perseverance or something. And I think they all have truth but they're not very useful mm -hmm. to someone who needs to get from Oregon to LA. So it's not that those things are occurring, it's that they are they dominate the conversation. Yeah, and they're they're mm -hmm. they're well mostly what I, from a from a user point of view John's question, they're not useful. You know, they they don't the 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 person listening there isn't a lot to get from. Someone starting out doesn't need an antelope clock. No one does, by the way, but someone starting out definitely doesn't. That's not where you start on that journey, matching the trainers of the guy who just made that walk. Um, but the but this kind of, the, the stories that they tell are just not useful. Well, I'm not sure that even, I mean, I don't have any stories of abuse and I don't necessarily know that my story is useful either, right? I think I have a story and it's useful to me to remember how I got to where I am, but sharing that story isn't going to get someone any further in their career. N no, and but your story, sorry, the reason that, that I want to be in conversation with you is that your story is that the stories are just that. The, mm. your, your strength is that you're present and you're paying attention right now. Right, but that's not my story. 
right? No, but it's not a story. That's the point. Well, it's this, not yeah, this a, what, that's what I'm it's saying. It's not a, a yeah. mythology. Yes. It's, it's actually a, you're, you're living it, yes. right? And that's what's exciting about how you approach your work. It's not the plugins you use, mm -mm. you know. I got to use the same six plugins today that I used yesterday. And I got wows on all the, the emails from mixes and I didn't wow. use a new plugin. I yeah, didn't do yeah, anything yeah, yeah. crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just this, this goes to a, a note I wrote this week. Um, um, what value can you get from a single question answered by someone you respect in a Q and A mm. versus subscribing to a channel of influence from that same person? Mm. So when we think about the format that that this conversation that, that you guys are both talking about is hap is uh, taking place in the uh, community is, um, it's not a um, um, deep and long um, ex uh, exchange of information and ideas and stories. Um, where you can go deep with a single person. So if mm -hmm. you have a, a subscription to mix with the masters, I mean, you may pick some favorite people, mm -hmm. um, but you're not getting the sort of week after week um, influence from somebody who's navigating the same world you are and um, thinking about things out loud. And they're just, that doesn't exist in our world. There are some podcasts in our world. I've tried to listen to them. I can't mm, get yeah. very far yeah, for, for various reasons. But um, this idea that like, if I could only get this question answered by somebody I respect, then I will be better. It's like, no, you need ongoing influence from influences mm. that you you know, you try to choose good ones, right? Yeah. Um, in, in podcast land, it's like subscribe to this, subscribe to that. In YouTube land, same thing. Um, you can sort of curate, so, you you're, know, your digital world. You're making a really good influences. point because, and I never thought about it. You mentioned this the other day and I didn't grab it the way I am now. The, the you know, let's talk about Pensado's place, right? Dave is a super likable guy, but the the... They, they, each episode is a kind of a loop that that comes back around on itself, and then the loop is repeated in the next episode. There is no, there is no arc to yeah. the to the to the show, and that's not being dismissive of it. It's just a, a statement of fact, I think. Hmm. Um, when you were talking, it brought to mind an engineer, and I'm going to be super vague, that um, super well known, um, that a lot of people would describe in very cartoonish terms his personality. Hmm. Right, that's all I'm going to say. Um, he's done records that everyone listening and you guys all know. Um, and I've had some really great conversations with him. Really great, um, warm conversations that I remember. And the reason I did is because I burned off the fog of the cartoonish personality. It is a, it is a, a maladaptive sort of behavior to nervousness and, and, um, and uh, you know, whatever, insecurity. And if you stick with it, eventually he runs out of steam and you can have really great conversations with mm. him. And very few people that I know have, and I'm not any kind of wizard, I just had time to kill <laughs> with this sure. guy and discovered this it doesn't, accidentally. It doesn't surprise A little bit yeah. of a wizard too. But, but. but, but my, my point is, is that the longer form that you're describing allows you to burn through these shell stories that we build, these mm. kind of narratives that shell protect stories. us. You know, the, the kind of... Uh, they're kind of like, well, guys, you know, I'm, I got here by doing this. And it's like, you know, eventually I run out of steam on that. Are you probe me enough? Or it just gets tiring to say it. Yeah. And one day I crack and actually tell you. It's just not how people learn. You, know. you yes. don't well, learn in like an instant like that. Like, no, no. Yeah. That's, that's my excitement for, um, at, the, at the time being, going, going live on Instagram, um, hopefully soon go to a different platform on that. But every Tuesday and working things out loud it's what I did that morning or the day before. And it's so in the moment, my reactions to the questions that are being asked because I'm actually practicing it in the moment and talking about it. But w at one point I went on to, you know, all these questions about what plugins you use. And I just went through the five or six that I use and got them out of the way because that's not how you're going to learn by knowing what I did. But you can always reference that at a point. But that's just not the way to learn. I mean, the tools that we use don't mean anything. So getting your antelope clock 
first. It doesn't make you a good mixer. Mm -hmm. And then also building up these stories and these narratives that you're telling yourself that this is what makes you a good mixer also doesn't mm -hmm. help us. So let's get that all out of the way and let's just have ongoing conversations about mm -hmm. what it means to be an engineer, a mixer, a producer, whatever you are. Let's mm -hmm. just have real life conversations about it in real time, not edited versions on, um, on a... a I don't want to keep going back to the two that we've already mentioned before, but it seems like the mix with the masters and the pensado spice is the only way to find these people that we look up to um, live in action. Yeah. But I always leave something to be desired because there's always a, oh, well, I'll show you what I did on this thing, but I won't show you this part, even though it's visible that it's there. But, oh, I did this with this EQ. And then before that, then you're just hiding secrets and let's just be fully transparent. And it mm. seems like the only way that we could... Um, have any influence over a, a younger um, demographic and generation of engineers moving mm -hmm. forward. So, I mean, I'd like to try to keep pushing that forward Yeah, with you guys. Michael? I love when you ask me if I have anything to add. Oh, like, I thought you were. Well, I had a question to ask Michael oh, um, go. Go. as well. Is there a, um, a voice or a group of voices that you have in design world that you actually can come to and say, these are inspiring reference mm. points and resources? Yeah, you know, in our text thread the other day, I mentioned Michael Beirut. Mm. Um, Spider shared a link from Paula Cher, who's a partner at Pentagram, an amazing, amazing design agency. Another partner is Michael Beirut. I've mm. seen him speak a few times. I tried getting hired from him a few times <laughs> when I saw him speak. Um, and uh, I've read like three of the books that he's written. And one of those books is... It's like 62 essays on design or something like that. And I read it in college and, and during college, they're teaching all these practical skills, Photoshop, you're hearing all the names of the, the tools mm -hmm. and everyone's obsessing over how well they know the tool or the tricks and whatever things you can do with it. And then I read this book, um, 62 essays on design and was like, he didn't mention Photoshop like once in this whole book or any of the tricks that anyone around me is speaking about. Like he's speaking about way higher order order things like communication as a concept. You know, these yeah. I it's been so long since I read it, but I just remember it being like, none of this is being spoken about in school. Uh, and it only a practitioner who has this many reps could even mm. publish something like this mm. and say something like this. And his focus was different and it it indicated to me that there's multiple focuses or focuses, focus eye, <laughs> the Fo multiple foci? things to, fo Focuses. to focus on. Yeah. Um, both the tools are important, but there's a lot of theory in the things that we're doing, both from a like, what does it mean to be an engineer? What is that life like? How can it be better to how do I use compression? And then in between, which is when is the right time or the wrong time or should I? And and so there's like just this kind of cascading um, set or group of questions that kind of go higher and higher order. Um, and I think it's really important or it was really important for me to realize that there were both. Yeah. Um, and that's Michael Beirut definitely helped a lot. Yeah, that's a whole different industry, right? And it's a different culture. It's a different economy. Mm. It's... Um, you know, it, it's interesting, the audio engineering, I mean, I know lots of smart pe audio engineers, right? Yeah. Very interesting people, um, plugged in, you know? Um, uh, I mean, you meet them every day. <laughs> yeah, but it's, there's not, um, you know, it's not like tech money you make as an audio engineer, right? right. Um, it's a different thing. Um, so the people who, the thinkers who are, say, in graphic design, you're talking about global communications. I mean, this mm -hmm. is at an epic scale. This is a very, you know, sort of... Um, we don't do global communication? I was going to... Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't mm. that what a hit record is? Mm. Yeah. Global communication? Uh, yes. However, the mm. audio engineer, like a graphic designer at that Michael Beirut's level is a communicator. An audio engineer is not the communicator. They're mm. the facilitator of communication. Mm. Yeah. They they are the the managers of the pipeline. <clears throat> oh, so sorry, can we drill on that for a second? Yes, isn't please. isn't a graphic designer? They don't decide that. Um, no, at the high levels they do. That's they, what I'm saying. No, at, but at Michael Beirut's level, it's like what Michael and I are doing now. Like we're mm. deciding what the message is, what the symbols are, what the 
what the oh, language is, n- what the... No, I don't mm. see it that way. Sorry. No, let's like, I see, you know, Ford is Ford and mm-hmm. they make SUVs. And when they hire a graphic designer, Ford are like, we should sell SUVs to moms, mm-hmm. um, 30 to 40 moms. Okay. And then they go to, I'm I'm mm-hmm. super naive here with Michael Beirut, but they go to Michael Beirut. This might be a comical, like mm-hmm. misreading of his ability or whatever, about right. but they go to him and say, we'd like to you know, we're mm-hmm. going to run a campaign in these platforms and we need you to design it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the message is, you know, something about SUVs and it's aimed at moms. Mm-hmm. And then he, so he's not the originator of the message either in the way that an engineer isn't, right? Isn't he a kind of an engineer, a kind of a producer it, that is, that's, that's drawing out the juice of the that's message? That's the junior level. So like at, at a higher level, he's they're deciding. Yeah, I, he's in the boardroom developing the message with them. Um, so okay, yeah, it, it's okay. a collaborative effort for sure. Well, you can you can uh, equate like, that to to an to an engineer to a degree too. Um, I, I kind of I see what you're what you're getting at, mm-hmm. and I imagine the best A and Rs and label executives they they piece together the team accordingly. To we always say to um, maximize the. Um, the the potential of the of the record and like the the outcome of it and giving you the best chances of winning and that's mm-hmm. the whole point of what the record label does and uh, at that high level so you're putting the players together in the thing so the you know the designer almost is like the producer though right so that's not really producer the same. maybe at that level yeah. Yeah. that yeah. level to producer, closer yeah. to producer, producer but each p- each piece of the puzzle brought in by the label or the team um, management whoever's calling the shots is still part of the design team. Mm-hmm. So, the, in in the sound design realm, the, at least. The more we tease it out, the more I'm seeing how wrong I was. Right. So the mm. in in music, the artist is is an originator of of a feeling or an emotion or a, a mm-hmm. the, the capturing of lightning in a bottle, and then the producer engineer help shape yeah. you know guide that to the world to the audience. Yeah. But four don't have any lightning in their bottle. They have mm-hmm. a product. So, and and the lightning actually does come from the from the high level design team, right? I, I mean, would I, that be fair? It could be in the, 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 in, it the depends. Insight. I mean, yeah. sometimes you'll have situations. I mean, most of the time there's some energy in house, which is why they would be uh, looking for someone outside or going to a design department to help them. Uh, that could be an investor relations team that has a message for investors or a product development team that has a message for customers about mm. a new product. So I, in a way, those teams are kind of analogous with an artist. They have a vision, they have an idea, mm. but they don't necessarily have the skills to flesh it out fully. Um, but also in the design industry, you have audi- um, software engineers, right? So there is an engineering component to this. It's not necessarily at the design end. I think it's closer to a producer. It mm. was sort of where Spider and I had to align, and we talked about that last week, yeah. was around that. Well, what is the role of a designer and what's the analogy to music? Mm. I'd say it's closer to the producer with um, producer like performer, right? They're playing the guitar, but they're also imagining that the guitar should be there. Um, there's actually a producer role. I know Apple has a ton of producers, they're called. Yes. Literally called producers. And so they're overseeing that vision at the same level as a producer. And then there's like designers that are cranking out that idea, more like performers. Yeah, the there's task, th- like the graphic designers you're thinking of are ta- t- task-based, deadline-based, um, sitting at the computer, mm-hmm. doing components yeah. so, of a project. And that's that's not, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. that's part of the... yes of the, the, the sort of career ladder or like post or something. The, yeah. the, yeah, the, the, the level that you're talking about, you know, I know nothing about Michael Beirut, but this, say, let's imagine the highest level of graphic designers. They're like an artist working with a set of constraints. So mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the artist is in a log cabin with a nylon string guitar and a four track cassette deck. And th- that's the constraints. And then they're, mm-hmm. they're harnessing whatever. Yeah. You I know. think like the, and, the Don Draper or Mad Men, like, that look at, you know, I, I that sort it. of lens is, yeah. well, it's advertising. So yeah. it's yeah. It, like design. It, mm-hmm. it is designed. It's very similar. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just for a specific purpose, right? Um, but um, I'm sure Michael can talk about all the ways that it's different, but it's the, you know, the the client sits at the end of the conference table and you're trying to draw out what the message is. 
the, you know the client is almost a constraint yeah, and in the show they never know yeah you know what i mean so mm -hmm. yeah. i think of the client as the log cabin or some kind of constraint mm -hmm. that you have to work with but the insight the graphic designer's insight of of how to visually represent a feeling or an emotion or a mm -hmm. need or a or a um, characteristic a characteristic or, yeah. that's the that's the lightning in the bottle that's that's the artistic moment yeah. really so yeah. it is closer to an artist than a yeah. than where I started so uh, something I love about <laughs> yeah, the, right. the, yeah. the, yeah, the origins of of graphic design um, it used to be called commercial art mm. I think that to me if I could bring that back I would I, I think it makes yeah. a lot more sense and it sort of explains what's at play. There's a clear commercial element to it. There's a clear artistic element to it. And you're this leader kind of bringing those two things together. Um, so in a way, um, the artist is the artist. The commercial part is usually ignored by the music artist. They're trying to see that as far away as, mm -hmm. as they can so they yeah. can feel inspired. Whereas me, I'm actually more inspired the more I know about the business because I know that's 50% of my actual title or original title, right? Mm. It's, it's, it's fundamental to what I'm going to be doing. So that, I like commercial artists. Yeah, yeah nice. me too. So that's really interesting. Sounds so nicer. you're running to sort of by my framing, but you're running towards the constraint you're like, give me the constraint because yeah, that fires it, me yeah. up. And what we would in in the record business, we think of constraints as being, we think of thinking of the audience or commercial goals as being somehow dirty. Yeah. Like, and we look down on it. Yeah. And I don't at all. No, yeah. You, you, yeah, yeah. I, I think. No, yeah. sorry, There's we don't. There. Yeah. Uh, it is. It is classically thought of mm -hmm. as like, yes. oh, he's a he sold out, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, weirdo, drug addicted artist in log cabin. He's the real deal. And he's like, yeah. is he the real deal? If he never, if he, if it never connected, if it never landed, <laughs> yeah. you know, well, there's 12 right. of us and we, you know, we're a cult and we listen to his record. It's like, <laughs> so th that, that, the constraint moving towards it. And mm -hmm. that, that is what high level pop production yes. is, is That's kind of embracing say. the constraint and then finding the, the, the challenge and the joy and the inspiration in that. Yeah. I mean, that That's, goes back to talking about what's better was talking about and then where you chimed in and we, we, we're working towards global communication. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what keeps me going on making pop records. I mean, I, I love pop. I don't listen to pop um, on, on for fun, really. I'm mostly listening to weird, obscure, like 60s and 70s psych records. But I want to participate in the global message if I can. If I can, it's the thing that keeps me inspired is is ears on the music that I yeah. work on um, and, and the, the, the way it could save a life or impact someone's thought process or it really can. And I, mm. I do though, hearing Michael talk and Spider and uh, we've all had this conversation aside. I mean, pop music kind of feels like commercial art. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's utility is to make people money, um, but also connect and, and make people f potentially feel deeper. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the, um, the, the necessity uh, of the creation, uh, but, mm. It sure would be great if it had some, but also you can just be at the bar and be fucking around and feeling good about it and not have to think about its deeper meaning. That makes it purely commercial, right? There's really no, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I see where you're trying not to devalue. I'm trying not to devalue it at the same time. Yeah, like I, I find a lot of value in in, mm -hmm. in no. popular music, but I mean, if you're relying on the music as your source of income, then it's ultimately any. Uh, genre would be considered commercial art in that way. It's, you know, so... Well, some more than others. And, this one yeah, seems and to some be... some are more focused on, like, I mean, I can go into a project and be like, this is definitely more the art side of the commercial end, you yes. know, 80-20. It doesn't need yeah, to be 50-50. Exactly. Other times, like, while this business is super complex, I need to understand it. I need to understand the customers really well, you know, and maybe that becomes 80% of my job and it's 20% is like, and here's an Instagram post or here's well, the yeah. logo. Or you imagine right. a McDonald's ad or a, you know, and the sort of transient mm -hmm. need to just sell more burgers for a dollar or a Porsche ad, which is part of um, a long history of very artful, very insightful um, communication mm -hmm. about a product that's yeah. deeply engineered, right? Um, uh, to, I was, to the McDonald's team's credit, also deeply engineered. Deeply engineered to a short-term goal. No? Mm. Unfair? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. I'm, I'm, thinking, qu I'm thinking quarterly and earnings and, and, and yeah, how that, yeah. that is the, mm. uh, that's the horse pulling that whole right. carriage, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about pop, the, the other night I went really deep the way that I do on uh, 
reading about filters and trying to understand something mm. for something I'm trying to design. And in when you talk about phase with signals, you talk about whether a filter causes the signal to lead or lag. Mm. And I was thinking about that in terms of pop music. You know, some pop music lags culture and some kind of leads it. It kind mm. of pulls us forward. Mm. And I think probably the records we're most excited about are the pop records that pull us forward. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking about that and then thinking about how on our conversation at home we did where I made the bold prediction that this this difficult moment would unleash a tidal wave of creativity mm-hmm. and I was proven mm. so wrong <laughs> on that, right? But then driving down tonight, listening to that Wafia track mm. that you mixed that um, I know there's one name that I'm going to forget, but um, Sarah Ahrens wrote and Digi, uh, Jamil Chamas, and yeah. there was one other name on the writing team gone from actually here. don't know yeah I actually don't know i um, only know those two that worked on it anyway a song that john mixed and uh, played played me last week after we recorded and i've listened to a bunch since in the studio and at home late at night on airpods but driving down tonight uh it really felt of the moment mm. um in the way that only a good pop song can and mm. um, it sort of had an achy melancholy and a slightly Posit- like it had everything. Yeah, I, yeah, it yeah. actually had mm-hmm. the things that I would waste time trying to use words for because sure. that's what we use music for. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right? And it feels it just, very LA and it feels very global. It felt yeah. super <laughs> LA coming down yeah. the 110. Like yeah. it really, really worked. And uh, listen to it twice in a but row. But it has just, just that right amount of nostalgia to it. I mean, if you listen to the tone of the guitar or the main synth, it's comforting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, it gives Fleetwood Mac vibes. Like yeah. that's what, that's... That is the reference point, mm-hmm. right? And like we know that, but for some reason it sounds now and new. And that's that thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago that just left enough that makes it, mm, I remember that. It's a symbol of that that decade, that time, but I haven't heard it done quite this way. This melody that Sarah's writing is just way on yeah. way ahead of the curve and it's organic and raw, but it's also really concise and deliberate and yeah. Yeah. it's all the right, it's all the it's right things. The other Sort of, you know, that that that's sort of the mechanics of it. But presumably, the X factor thing that we can't put our finger on is the fact that Sarah and Digi and whoever the third party is. Maybe it was the artist. I don't know. Um, I'd have to look at the credits again. But that they are open and uh, in tune with the moment. Mm. And this song hilariously could have been written like two years ago. And I'm like mm-hmm. making this pitch for how it captures the moment. But whatever, I it think landed. It was written a year ago. It landed with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right now. So. Yeah, um, it was released now. Yeah, yeah it was released now, and it feels right. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we yeah, I don't want to go too far into what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is that it feels like we're mixing the, or making, the, creating the same song over and over again. I'm, I'm glad that we have a couple of these outliers that we can point to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, makes me feel good. I mean, that's, that's what I'm, I'm looking for. thinking about for. what makes it feel good. Though. Yeah. It's like, but you can't just because it's different. Is that novelty mm-hmm. enough to make it's it? Not, yeah, it's but not, it's not, not it's even that different. I think it's like mm-hmm. some degree of risk taking. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's like makes you like root for somebody or draws you in somehow. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. I feel like there's the stuff that John referenced to me felt like the mechanics of it, which of course, as someone who spends his day in the, in that space, you're going to immediately, you know, you know how it's constructed, right? Yeah. The nostalgia of the guitars and the and the, the synth and whatever. Yeah. Uh, that Sarah's v- rhythm, rhythmic sort of uh, yeah, vocal yeah. melody stuff. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, but the... Fun to I f- do. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, her, her and stuff, fun to yeah. sing along with. I feel yeah. like when you get all, like there are lots of songs we know that have all of those things in place and don't land, mm. don't resonate. And I think you get those mm. things in place and you create a moment where it's like, then maybe it can channel something. It can channel a feeling in the artist or a, or a moment in time. Or, and sometimes it just doesn't. It's just you've just uh, or arranged the parts of a good song, but you, don't, you didn't capture the whatever. The, yeah. the X factor is a horrible phrase, but uh, the, 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 the extra thing that makes art special. Spirit. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, spirit. I the think spirit. The, the spirit. I think the, yeah. I think the engineer's role, uh, or at least this is how I put myself in the equation as the engineer is to, really listen over and over again to find that spirit and yes. to pull it out. Because mm-hmm. the spirit is is in there. I mean, Digi and Sarah and Wafia put the spirit in there. Yes. Um, I'm not saying, like, again, talking about the design conversation, like, I am not, I, I don't have the, the lyric uh, choice. I'm not putting that global messaging out there, yeah. but I want to have, I want to um, 
uh, I always use that word, the word embolden. I'm trying to embolden that mm. that that encoding to to uh, to deliberate it out yeah, to the yeah. world as as loud as possible. And the only way to do that is to make sure that spirit is emphasized mm. and really. I mean, really hit the belly. I mean, it's yeah. like full body. Like you have to, I mean, you can get that in, in all genres of music, but in pop, that's really, that feels difficult to me because um, I always go back to how slammed things feel and how non-dynamic and flat they feel. And they just feel like they pass by you. And then the next one, the next song comes on the playlist and they yeah. pass by you. But the one that feels more alive than the other, maybe, yeah, maybe like Spider said, we're rooting for them. That's who we mm-hmm. want. We want the the ones that are just slightly left. So you've, you've touched on something that I get super wound up about, mm. which is, you know, on any online conversation about the level wars, you know, I master records, lots of people get mad about the level wars and, you know, I would like if things were quieter, sure. sure. Um, but, you know, a common response that I'll drop in one of those threads is, you know, I, I want to listen to good records, not dynamic records. Now, just being dynamic doesn't make a record good. There's no. lots of shitty dynamic yes, records. Yes, yes. So we're thinking about how these things, certain things need to be in place for the, or often it helps when certain things are in place, the mechanics of groove, melody, mm. a singer we believe in. And then the, the uh, what was your word, Spider, so I don't say X Factor again? Oh, spirit. Then spirit. the spirit sometimes gets channeled and sometimes doesn't. <laughs> and then on the flip side, there are records that where the groove is, is broken mm-hmm. and the sound is awful mm-hmm. and the singer sounds like they're a they're a hostage mm-hmm. and but the spirit is so fucking strong that you I mean, try listening to Ethiopian jazz you never know what you're gonna get yeah right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> but the spirit the spirit yeah. is undeniable is, yes I mean just... I was I was making a tra- mixing a trap record yesterday and I was having a really hard time not nudging the the vocal that was so ahead of the beat in the bridge because in the bridge, the drums drop out and it felt like, I think there was headphone bleed, like it was tracked over the part like the, of the beat when it was, when the drums were in. Yeah. But it was so ahead. I was like, I'm going to move this. But I moved it in time, quote unquote. Like I actually put a snare on every the downbeat was, yeah. just mm. to move it and then mute the snare again. Mm. And it just didn't feel good. It didn't mm. feel, uh, it, it lost the spirit. I mean, yeah. this, this girl's fucking good. Like I can't wait for this this record to come out. And her energy and her spirit is is ingrained in that. And when I moved it in time, quote unquote, so it quote unquote felt better, it didn't feel better. Yeah. Yeah, I just like, yeah, yeah. I checked myself. I mean, I tried it though. It's, to me, it was worth the try. It's writer, it's, like, it's not better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But spirit is is everything. And that's that correlates with taste. Um, as a producer or an engineer, I mean, you have to have the taste. So I have to decide in that moment if um, I want to, have it be right or good, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and to me, and, and you know, she she liked it as it was, so why, who am I to say this? But that's that's uh, that's a big part of the job and understanding that. Yeah, and, and the, then, but then spirit. you can lean into the tension, mm-hmm. you know, in the mix. Oh, yeah, I automated yeah. up some saturation yeah. on that part. Yeah. And, like, I really dug in. Yeah. That's See, a really good point, yeah. You, gotta, you have to appreciate it you, to, you, to do that. You try to fix it, in air quotes, and it didn't work. And then you you're discovered. You're confident that, yeah. in your in your decision to. Oh yeah. To embrace the the whatever the funk. Yeah, yeah commit. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. It was hard. I have to admit. That's why I'm bringing it up. I had to admit it was very hard to let that go. Yeah. Um, because I want to. My engineer brain and my producer brain, my groove brain, says that groove is broken. It's not right. But then when when the drum fill comes in after the beat drop and you're like, oh, it's so satisfying. Mm. It didn't feel as satisfying being on the gr- on yes. the grid yeah. than that fill. It had less tension. Exactly. It's a kind of yeah. tension, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It was a, it was a big moment. It's yes. like the, yeah. you know, when the drums drop out in God's plan, how like a head Drake is. It's exactly like that. If somebody fixed it, it'd be pretty boring, yeah. I would think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's a great, that's exactly right. It's the moment. Yeah. I'm um, sure I erased that tension in like about 12 years of records that I made. <laughs> I remember having a moment, and we talked about that before, of listening to a, a Tom Waits record that I just went, just was a huge for me, was Mule, Mule Variations. And it's a, kind of a, a fucked up, you know, it, the, the stories are, are, I'm sure, kind of colorful, but it was recorded at, um, name will come for me in a minute, it's someplace up near where he lives. Um, and... Uh, it's studio, you know, it's a studio, but they have all these outhouses and the story is, you know, Tom went in and tried playing piano in the studio and tried recording. It's like, no, fuck this and went in the outhouse 
And a friend of mine worked with him there around that time. They were shooting a movie and went and, and filmed some stuff with him. And they did actually record in all the outhouses with the chickens and the, and the dogs and the bleed and the very raw sounds. Anyway, the record blew my mind and changed how I listened to records. Mm. And one night listening to it, I had this realization that I could never have made this record that I love so much. Yeah. I would have fixed everything that was wrong. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I was just kind of crumbling in my couch at right home now. kind of going I like mm. I would have fucked all of just, this how many of the records I got my hands on were were ha, I don't know yeah. right but anyway I did my best every day up until that point and every day since but it just was really strong in me that I wouldn't have I wouldn't have left well enough alone in the way that you did yesterday mm. I would have tried to fix all of it well, I did. well, well there's a I mean there's a great story from Tony Maserati in our live um conversation that we did when I interviewed him about about this and it, it's great to go reference and listen to like when he was kind of uh, told that the feel was gone because he cleaned up the noise right and mm -hmm. he says it best it was you know it's just worth referencing um, because that's that happens to all of us and until we hear or have that example we fix engineers fix designers color inside the lines till yeah. they scribble out and they're like oh wait that was cooler because that rule yeah, is now yeah. broken it's like we all do it until we have that moment so i'm glad that moment happened for you prairie sun studios it just came to my mind uh -huh. yeah this goes to one of our biggest questions which is what is the visual stimulus doing to us while we're mixing right mm -hmm. it's like what is the interaction with the computer display or the big 65 inch tv or whatever it is we're using and the plug-in ui and all the flashing <laughs> lights and everything or whatever else we might do if we have tvs on and like extra you know other ones movies playing or whatever um what is that doing to our ability to hear is that somehow limiting our bandwidth you know to take in audio perception and it makes me think about graphic designers right because it's almost the opposite like, it makes me wonder if Michael could mm. sit at the PMCs and listen to records that he loves and do graphic design work at the same time. Like, would the audio stimulus from this enormous speaker system um, engage your emotion, your nervous system so much that it distracts you from the mm -hmm. sort of visual work you're doing? Mm -hmm. It's it just, it seems like... Um, but that's, yeah, that's something we have an to... An open question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been thinking about it with you for, for years. I mean, as, as everyone at this table knows, I mean, I have a screensaver hot corner. So after every move, I put the screen to screensaver and listen, and then I undo the move, and then I listen again. And I mm. make sure the move is an improvement. Um, this is what Spider would call uh, value judgments that are happening um, at every moment, whether or not I'm admitting that I'm having them or not is besides the point. But this is what we do. So press play, look. I mean, I never, I, the EQ is always off the screen when I'm listening to see if there's an improvement. If you want to bypass it, you bypass it without the visual of it being there. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to remember what I did, right? So this is, I mean, these are little- We've all tricked ourselves, right? Yes. Like we've all seen the change visually and heard it, except like it was in bypass mm -hmm. when we were doing it. Exactly. Like everyone's done yeah. that at yes. some point. So we know that the visual stuff is priming us. We know priming of the brain is a thing in our mm -hmm. perceptions. And I mean, this is, this, is, this is connected to the desire to fix things. Um, because you're seeing the problem visually mm -hmm. as well, right? Um, yeah. We, we talked about it yeah. earlier in the week. I was trying out a new EQ in the studio, trying a slightly different approach to something and, uh, you know, full, fully aware of the, of the changes I was making and how they were changing, you know, oh, 250 down, half DPI, I'm going to take out a DB. It feels great. That's much tighter. Going to make the snare pop at 4K. EQs and bypass the whole time. Like, you know, I, mean, I was hearing everything I did mm. You know, if I'd taken a walk around the block it's and come humbling. back. It's humbling. It's like... It happens all the time. Yeah. Um, Makes but, you wonder what's happening all the time. Well, this is... this is, <laughs> And we touched on it um, in, a, in a conversation. <laughs> I want to know. During the week. Well, you I can't think, know. Well, here's the thing. I we think... Can know more, I'm sure. Why it's mm. so difficult is that it varies enormously. Um, so we talked about the idea of food... Um, or exercise or medication affecting different people differently. So you meet people and they say, you should take 40 milligrams of whatever because mm. I took it and I had way more energy. Mm. Mm. It's like, well, that's cool, but I don't have your physiology. You're 300 pounds and you can run a marathon in the morning before breakfast and you eat eggs. 
I'm 130 pounds and I don't do any of those other things, right? So we're not the same. We don't have the same physiology. Right. That won't have the same effect. Um, does that mean we shouldn't all get a good night's sleep? Mm. I'm preempting you, John. <laughs> of course, it, do, it doesn't, you know. Um, so, but with visual stimuli, there are people, there are studios I go in and, you know, I feel like I've been irradiated. It's like there's six screens. They're, they're all at maximum brightness. There's fluorescent light overhead. And you're kind of going, you know, not only can I not listen to make a value judgment here, I'm not sure I can hold a conversation. <laughs> like, I feel like, oh my God, I, I know. feel like I'm in headlights and I'm just, about to be shot. Just cortisol exploding. Yeah. Out of here, right? Just, yeah. But yeah. clearly this person often is doing work that I like or respect and, and, you know, in their own way, they're crushing it. And they're maybe they're a composer for movies at a, at a high level. So they have, they obviously have different requirements to me. I could give them, you know, this kind of daylight or really, really, uh, you know, comforting uh, electric light in a, in a darkened room at night, everything optimum, yep. and that it would have no effect on their output. Like they right. would just be like, okay, that, bro, whatever. Yeah, but that makes me think of would, would it have no effect on their output 20 years from now though too? Mm. Will it have it 10, mm. 20 years? And I think that's, mm. that's why when you, you, you're saying you're preempting me and like I'm talking about health always and sleep and yes. good nutrition is I'm not thinking about now with it. I'm thinking about being able to do it in 10 years from now when I'm still yeah. called, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm super yeah. longevity. And it's the same. So it's a, it's one of these dimensions, right? Sensitivities, dimension. So mm. you've got people who can go to war and see craziness for years and be solid for the rest of their life. Come home okay. That's yeah. Yeah. so crazy. I mean, yes. we don't wish this on anyone. Well, what's the percentage of that there versus are, the other? But there are, and, and the military, you know, filters through the, you know, filters people through a process. Um, one, sensitivity changes within an individual. I mean, just look at your eyesight, you go into a dark room, you know, yeah. and it's like your sense, it's all adapting sensitivities, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you can handle some stress. Can you sort of guess if it's gonna be too much like down the road? I always overestimate Same. overworking, like the yeah. impact it's going to have. On yes. Me. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. always burnt out mm -hmm. earlier yeah. than I mm -hmm. expect. So, so much. You know? So, uh, but yeah, we, you, you do need to like, I mean, that's taking care of yourself. I mean, it's, yeah. it's this ties fundamental. Into, and, but this is, but it's yeah. not necessarily um, in the narrative that is taught in completely, you know, in what we, what we, Called the mixed down industrial complex, right? That's not what it's taught. No, not, even, no. not even close. It's yeah. so yeah, it's so far from that. And to me, that is what allows me to have my maximum output and my maximum connecting output um, and desired output on my own and from my clients. That's the the most important part. It's yeah. not the practice in the EQ. It's the practice of preparing myself to be ready to make the EQ decision. It's, uh, at least yeah. that's how I feel. I mean, everyone's going to no, feel different, no. but... It's, it's it's the number, you know, work-wise, it's the number one thing I respect about about what you do yeah. um, is is mm. that that stuff, how you approach it. I'm, I'm brought back to our conversation last week about, um, you know, and I was, I, I was the, the, the most guilty party uh, in terms of these prescriptive solutions. And what comes to mind is, so the idea that, you know, I go in a room with lots of screens. It affects my ability to hear. So I say to people, you shouldn't have lots of screens. That's really bad advice mm -hmm. to people for whom, uh, if they need access, if you're a composer, you need all your soft sense, all your articulations. They've got, you know, a composer I work with has 1,500 channels in his template, mm. uh, 1,500 tracks. He needs giant screens, but right? But that's, that's, not, that's not bad advice. It's just there's no solution within, baked into that advice. Well, You're not saying, well, what if you put, what if you tried putting the screens over here and making these in more of a dark mode because they're not primary. Like You're not thinking of another version of what could be with and those that's screens. That's more individualized even, advice. Exactly. Right? Yeah, sure. my, my point is that my generic, my, oh, so this, why I'm thinking about it is that I, I read this uh, blog post recently, Seth Gordon blog post, and he was like, we tend to see things, we ten, tend to think of reality as sort of the universe we see. And mm -hmm. he gave a great example, which was how many moons are there in our solar system? So, uh, and it's oh. funny, I've asked three people and everyone guessed, uh, me, uh, my wife, Sydney, and my daughter, Ellie, we all guessed within two of each other. How many moons are there? In I actually don't know. I would say like 11. Solar system of eight planets. Yeah. So, 
I don't know. Uh, 11? 11. Uh, very ballpark. 15. I think like nine. 189. Right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And his Doesn't point was, me. we live on Earth yeah. with one moon, yeah. but Saturn has mm-hmm. 20 whatever. So mm. we think, because our neighborhood has one moon, most planets must have one moon. But yeah. we have seen in Star Wars there was a planet with two. <laughs> right. So we, yeah. kind of, we kind of operated a bit. Yeah, sure. Um, and the point is, I go into the studio, in my, in my planet, screens are bad, but for a composer who doesn't, uh, who isn't affected by bright screens, not having enough access to his mm. plugins and his articulations and his, uh, you know, MIDI fucking scroll editor is bad. So my advice doesn't land, mm. and it really. Uh, well, that, that's I, also a composer, right? Um, if we think totally. narrowly on mix engineers, yeah, right. Um, no, it's, uh, it's yeah, uh, it, you get closer to a similar set of considerations. I'm, well, right, what's on the screen? The film is on the screen. I mean, com- if they can't see the film, <laughs> then how do they score the cue points? I but mean, let me finish the point, because yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I found last week of all, all of our conversations to be the most frustrating and the most productive for me mentally. Mm, mm. I, I chewed on last week's conversation more than either any of our previous ones. Mm. Um, and... One of them was this this tendency I have to be prescriptive, and you know Spider's point and and our sort of exploring of it, of how so ultimately my drive to help people is just as strong as it was before I sort of had some of the realizations we had last week and and got to think about them. So I'm I'm keen to mm. be more effective in the world. I want to help people using less of my energy and, and help them move along. You know, we do a lot of this in, in our work, uh, in both of my work, Mastering Records and, and Acoustics work with Spider and Kyle. Um, but that's sort of where I was headed with it is mm. kind of, it's yeah. not like I'll never give another piece of advice. I just want it to be more useful. I, mm. like, I like this table and this conversation to be a place to model all of the coulds, all of the... Uh, versions of having a screen and not having a screen yeah. and actually Inter- thinking about it. Interrogated. Yeah, and not, yeah. and not of course, definitely not prescribing because, I mean, I see mixer. I go into a studio and there's a basketball game on and I don't get distracted by the basketball game. I'm still working. I don't even watch basketball. I don't even know why that's my example, but I've seen it in a studio. I'm like, oh, I could do that here. No, I couldn't, but it didn't bother me there. So it's all depends on everything anyway, mm. what's going on. But we want, we want minimal friction um, in the in the creative process for whatever it is that you're specializing in, which at some point I'd like to get into the specialization aspect of uh, and picking what you specialize in and when you do that um, mm. down the line, and maybe we can mm. talk about this later. But if you specialize in the finalizing of a song, uh, maybe mastering engineer, let's take you for instance, mm. what is the value of you seeing the stereo left right track on a screen in front of you like you don't you don't have any business working within that right let's just say again working the extreme you're only using an analog eq it's mm-hmm. only dials it's only knobs and, and sliders you don't have to have a screen nope. at all because you can marker back to the beginning mm-hmm. with a shortcut like there's zero utility now if you wanted to watch um, you know, a basketball game while doing it on silent, then you would need a screen for that. But that's not uh, informing the creative process at all. So you don't need it, right? So that's out out the window. Potentially that's, distracting. Potentially distracting, right? Thank you. But then you step up to the mixer or step down to the mixer role. Before that, they have anywhere from twelve to two hundred and forty-eight uh, tracks that they have to manipulate. So therefore. To a degree, they require a screen, right? Mm-hmm. To a degree, they require at least one screen. Okay, cool. How big is that screen? Do they need to see the mix window and the edit window at the same time? Are they a producer and they need to see the arrangement window at the same time as the fader window? Like, just thinking about specifically the utility of, they are now, they require it. The interesting thing about screens, just as an aside, is that wh- how do we interact with screens in every other part of our life? It's either it's either a kind of a detached sort of um, semi sleep state when you watch TV, or it's consumption of data, and it's a very different gear to mm, making it making art. I mean, that, no? those are two those are two versions, but also watching a beautifully 
crafted and directed Italian oh. art oh. house film. And okay, like there's so, ways uh, of, that's sure. not data. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to push back. Okay. So of the amount of hours in front of screens today which, in America, would you like to put a number on how much of that was spent watching uh, Italian <laughs> oh, wait, art house? I only thought there was, I thought there was <laughs> no, only no, one moon no, around. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, the, you know, so I'm talking in general, people use screens for a, either a kind of a vegetative I don't know how many titives were in that, but Enough. you know that kind of uh, state or a kind of uh, what time is the flight leaving? Uh, you know, mm. wh where's my Amazon order? It's it's so screens put us in a mode. We mm. we uh, Spider and I were talking about my dream for my dream mastering room mm. for for sort of um, it it ties back to. Sorry, I don't want to lose your point. You were you were trying to finish something with the producers. No, no, no. I like this. I kind of want you okay. to keep going because I have a yeah. thought so, to add to this as well so in regards to we, screens. Yeah. We, were, we were talking a few weeks ago about, about you know, there's round pegs who come to LA and find a round hole slot in, boom, mm. smash it, great. You know, the money and the, and the adulation and the Grammys come hard. Mm. Um, and then there are people, you know, for, for lack of a better description, like Spider and I, who in various ways have achieved things that we're proud of, but sort of haven't had our, our moment uh, mm. in the sun just yet. And this idea that we're, we're not round pegs, we're not square pegs, we're, we're oddly shaped. And that if there's going to be a hole we slot into, we've got to make it. Mm. This podcast mm -hmm. is, is the hole that Spider and I, uh, uh, with you guys are slotting into. Mm -hmm. It's one way of expressing how we're, how we're unique, right? Mm -hmm. And, the, how we got onto this conversation, I don't, maybe it was outside Circuit's house, whatever, but um, how we got onto it was, was me saying that there are, you know, the mastering room that I work in is amazing in every respect. It, it is, it is, you know, world class. Mm. Um, and yet I feel that I need, because I'm not a round peg, a round peg could take that room and, and knock out their highest level of work. Mm. For me, I don't feel I've done that yet. Mm. Um, and, when I think about the things that I need, so for example, one of the things I want to do is stand up when I work mm -hmm. so that I can move. Uh, so there's a longer arc to this story, which is, you know, I grew up in Ireland, Catholic repressed Ireland. I'm a skinny um, boy growing up in a very wound up country about bodies and, and, and uh, you know, not quite body shame is too strong, but like certainly no comfort with physicality. Mm. Um, I didn't have the sports dimension to my life where I where I sort of engaged with my body that way. I certainly never danced. So I have this kind of uncomfortable relationship with my body that um, that I sort of recognize as something I've got to break through, you know? Yeah. But moving to music, I feel like I would make better mastering decisions if I could fucking shake my ass. Mm. If I could move instead of being in a chair, I would think less. You can't move in the chair? Uh, I move in the chair, but I, I move all the time. I feel like I would think less and move and feel more mm. if I was standing, right? Mm. The next thing is the screen. So I've talked about this idea where, you know, in mastering, we move between these, we're supposed to listen emotionally. Mm. Uh, I've, I've got to understand what the song is about. Is it angry? Okay, so I need to hit minus eight and a half, LUFS. The low end is a little light and this song is angry. So I want to bring out that angry, I want to enhance that angry feeling, mm. right? I don't want to make it sweet. I want to, I mm. want to enhance it. Um, that's the emotional listening. But I've also got to find that resonance at, you know, 2800 on the guitar because it's really dominating the mid-range. Mm. And I've got to de-click the intro and the, the second bridge. Yeah. So immediately we've got two modes. So what I, what I uh, want to explore is the idea that I stand and I listen with no screen and mm. I make EQ decisions. And when I get in the mode where I've got to de-click or, or fuss of over an edit or answer an email... I sit at a separate workstation mm, that yeah. I physically separate those things. Wow. Now, <laughs> does Dave that I share the room with need to do that? Absolutely not. Mm. He he excels in in the um in the current workflow, email and uh, you know, DAW on the same screen. Mm. I'm thinking, I feel I have an intuition that maybe for me, the next level of my work that I'm one of those people for whom 40 milligrams of whatever right. doesn't have the same effect yeah, as yeah, it yeah. does. Right, right. So separating that and on and on there are there are there are you know daylight things like this right so it's about creating optimum conditions and i've spent plenty of time beating myself up for not getting the results that i want even though i have good tools yeah you know it's like i got the seven thousand dollar eq you know God, it's that. to do with input it's to do with with you know the, the stuff i'm working on all that but ultimately 
all I'm really interested in is unlocking the next level, you know? Yeah, that, that makes me think of something that has kind of really impacted my life outside of music so much. And I'm, I'm now listening to you and thinking about how it could be really helpful um, for you to kind of hear this from me. That's why I love being across the table from you is, yeah, I'm I'm the one that would tell you to take the 40 milligrams. Like that's to me sounds completely ridiculous that you would need two two setups to do that because I just uh, compartmentalize those into different, the, okay, well, I'm in this. I remember I have to do that. I'll either put a marker or I have to de-click, but right now I'm working on the arc of, this, out of, of the record. And like, mm-hmm. I, I can separate the two really efficiently and can come back to it. But when I was on the screen note, thinking about our our, our minds and our bodies and we uh, correlate spaces with, with memories and um, episodes and things that we like to do in those spaces, right? So the minute you, you're you going to bed every night and your screen is on you, it's like you forget that that's where you go to sleep. That's yes. where you listen to that podcast or that's where you now watch that last YouTube video before. Now that's a YouTube space. Now that's a visual space. It's not mm-hmm. a sleep space. Yeah. Um, you now we can go around the, the, the apartment or house wherever you are and talk about what those spaces mean to you and everything. But I have a very specific space where I meditate every morning uh, with windows so the sun hits my back and I can I can meditate on that sensation, sounds of cars going by. It's a very optimal place. And it's really easy to meditate there because I've made it my area of meditation, right? Yes. But recently, I've been also sitting there just to sit there to relax. And in the beginning of the time, I felt uh, meditative as soon as I sat in that chair. Mm. That was the chair that I would relax in. And then even more recently, I'm talking like a week or two ago, I started sitting there and also using my phone. No. <laughs> Ooh, the meditations have been so much harder now. You broke this, it. In that chair, I kind of broke it. I'm, I'm unbreaking it. The last two days have been very good. I don't sit there without, even if it's in my pocket, like I'll even get the urge to pick it up. I only sit there without it on me, except for when I'm meditating, I put it on the table uh, next to it. And I'm making, I'm trying to recreate that space. So if you need to, if you need to have the listen only, emotional listening only space in the studio, then create that space in the studio. Completely. Yeah. In that, yeah. because you only want to do that in that spot. Yeah. Uh, I think that there, I could argue that there's some practices to do to be able to do them both in the same spot. I've, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm. But you might have to do them separately first before you can converge that's, on that. That's the thing. I've, yeah. tr- that's the thing. I've tried a lot structure of structure. Is a is is a crutch. It I, helps yeah. guide. I mean, it's yeah. structure. Right? I'm, a th- I'm a thinker, and I'm weak in some ways. You know, I'm a, I, I lean towards being a thinker. Mm. Um, so you know, w- you know, we talk about these two worlds that I have a foot in: the, the sort of artistic and the and the engineering or the technical. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm definitely more technical than I am artistic. Mm. But but I I want to lean into my artistic side. I sort of abandoned it when I was younger. For for reasons that we'll come back to some night. Wait, but what if um, you what if you double down on the fact that you are more technical? Oh, I had this thought on the way down. What I, if you? I don't want to go there. No, I want to. What wanna, do you mean? Uh, uh, okay, we don't uh, have to no, go no, there. No, no, no. I I do want to go there. But yeah, yeah, no, you. I, I want to. We have to go there. I want to. I want to <laughs> ask Michael one thing. Okay, because please. this this spaces thing. I remember having a visceral reaction to you. Uh, remember you said you had something in the shower where you could write mm. and I flipped out. I was oh, like, yeah, yeah, you can't do that. You can't have information in the shower. The shower must be the sacred space for ideas to come. Mm. When was that? That was like, that was probably a year ago. Yeah. Um, I remember that too. Yeah. It freaked me out. Yeah. But being in the shower without, like without, I, I mean, I would do voice recordings when I was in the shower, dry my hand really quick mm-hmm. because you start living with so much like disappointment from losing, all those lost ideas. Losing like, ideas. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, that was Michael's argument. And I, and I actually, mm-hmm. I mean, you kind of won me over, but I, I didn't get a notepad for the shower. I, it I makes it less complicated. I can give you one. I have an extra. Um, <laughs> I have like four extras. Uh, it To me, it goes back to John's point earlier where he was saying, well, you know, what does it look like 10 years from now doing that? And I, I felt like, I could look back in the past 10 years and be like, there were so many ideas I had in the shower that I was so excited about and was like, this is really going to make that thing I'm already excited about even more awesome. Mm. And I just forgot them. And then I had this and I don't write in, it's not like I go in there and journal every time I shower. There's days and weeks where I don't write in it at all. And there's days where we're in the thick of it 
And it might have been a night that Spider had been over. We were working on PMC stuff or I was just speaking with the client. I go for a walk. I take a shower and I'm like, oh, yeah, I have this meeting that's coming up and I need to I, I would love to mention this thing. It could really help. Mm. And now it's not on my mind in the shower. Now the shower becomes more of, of yeah. a real more meditative yeah. place. It's, oh. yeah, it's more inviting yeah. of the ideas because, yeah. because they mm. can be put to use ah, so I'm almost saying actualized. It, I don't even know if it's inviting the ideas it's allowing the ideas to to leave me and just be somewhere so yeah. that I can be in the shower when I am super relaxed which I, I love showering it's amazing it's one of my favorite things to do um, <laughs> and we love that you shower regularly yeah I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't have loved how I it smelled earlier so much today to yeah. <laughs> eight mile walk <laughs> um, but anyway um, yeah I, I find that it it allows me to have a more enjoyable, more relaxing shower when I'm not like, oh man, remember this, remember this. Because yeah, I just yeah. know my memory and I know well, I that's won't. that's what's better saying. You're inviting in the ideas because you're freeing yourself mm. of the stress of of trying to uh, yeah, avoid the, them occurring. The stress, oh, okay, the stress yeah. Yeah. chokes off the source, right? Yeah. Right, uh, right. In, in Subconsciously. Yeah. yeah. I, I took it as uh, I'm inviting, like now the shower time becomes the oh, yeah. ideation time. And, it, it, and I think that's how you initially were perceiving it. It's like now yeah, the space yeah, is... Yeah is my well, I, second studio. As you know. someone, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was funny to me in our text thread earlier, we, we talked about recording on Tuesday and you're like, no, Tuesday, girlfriend night. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fucking right on, dude, pr mm -hmm. protect it. And then I was thinking like, for me, like any day, is family day. I'm forced into a, into mm. a, into a, mm -hmm. at gunpoint every day, choosing between feeding my family or spending time with them. And mm. um, so like all seven days are family day. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, how much of this do I want to give up mm. to make the money to pay the rent for <sighs> the house that we live in? a horrible way to describe no. our economy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, no, I'm saying it's a valid point of view, yeah, but yeah. it's, yeah. it's not how I live, uh, you know, and, and, no, uh, I know that, but, yeah. you know, in, in my, yeah. but, but it occurred to me, that was the like, nanosecond chain of thought when yeah. I saw you, you know, and it was like, you protect that time because you, because yeah, it's you also know. new to me. So, yeah. um, no, you know, maybe at some point that, that, that becomes a little bit more flexible, uh, but it's not right now. Yeah. Um, and, and it, no, I, I, I saw it as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, me too. Yeah. But it, uh, I see all of our schedules as a positive thing mm -hmm. and, and all of our, the, the compli the potential complications, um, it will take to even make these episodes happen. I, I, I mean, I want them to happen more than anybody, but I want our lives to happen too, um, and I don't want to add any more stress. And our lives are the fuel. Uh, this yeah. conversation is nothing mm -hmm. if we're not living. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, okay, so specialization. Can we? Yeah, yeah specialization. But so before this, we hold on, before we go into specialization, no, it's to do with the story. Okay, I'm, I'm tying it together. Okay, like the thing that I said Jeez. I didn't want to talk about. Okay, please. Next level. Yeah. So we're. I'm driving down today. So I have technical ability. People come to me for it uh, today. I get, you know, because of my previous work with PMC and because of all the friendships I have in the clients and, you know, you master a record for a client or you tune a room and, you know, my technical ability becomes apparent. Like I seem to know some stuff about some technical things. So, you know, someone will say, yeah, this isn't working. Like, oh, you just need to do this or whatever. Don't get that. Get one of these, whatever. And um, so a lot of people come to me for technical answers to problems mm. today driving down, I totted it up. I had four separate um, email or text conversations from, you know, from close friends to friend clients to mm -hmm. kind of associates mm -hmm. um, looking for technical guidance. Um, so to me, when you say lean into my ability, that's a clear evidence of a demand, mm -hmm. right? People are looking to me for technical guidance. And, you know, increasingly in my life, I'm letting those calls go to voicemail. Mm. I'm getting back to the text conversation two days later because I'm, I'm actively training a world of people in LA and beyond that I'm not their source of free tech advice. When, mm -hmm. the, when, when, my, when the engine that drove me was being liked by people, mm. then I would sacrifice in my time on, the, on you know, watching a cartoon with my daughters to answer that text about which converter they should buy. Mm-hmm. I'm making different decisions now. Mm. And, but ultimately, I feel ambitious about my ability to be artful and I mm. want to see what's possible. Oh, I really like that. You know? And so yeah. just because I'm good at technical stuff doesn't mean to me that I should be trapped by it. In fact, it sort of emboldens me to take risks in more artistic listening. I want to be, I want to be 
you know, if I had an ambition in mastering, it would be to be known as a very artful, tasteful, emotional mastering engineer who kind of people find out after is actually built the gear that he's using. Right. Right. Or designed it, right, whatever. Right, right. Some yeah. crazy like technical achievement. Crazy. Yeah. Like I put a fucking man on the moon. Nope. But you know, <laughs> crazy. Like he built his own DI box. <laughs> and but some some this is that, your that would be that would be the footnote. Yeah, but this yeah. is it. Yeah, I, I hope so. That's what I mean, I, that's what is. I'm working it's for. Swear, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. That's what I'm working for. So I think that sort of ties together the ambition conversation we had a few weeks ago. Specialization, because it would, you know, if I asked my accountant, what should I do to make money? He'd say, well, you know, what do people come to you for? Well, four people hit me up today, bro, looking for technical advice. Clear demand. And I actually thought, I put it my, on the drive down, I put myself in the mind of an accountant and in the mind of the model that we've built with um, Unfuck projects. And I thought, what if I charged $150 for a half hour call? Mm -hmm. And I did six calls a day, mm -hmm. right? I think I could bring $150 of value to a ton of people. Mm -hmm. And, and I could make I could make a living. Save them. I could, a bunch I could of money, spend the sure. afternoon on the couch with my daughter watching cartoons. Um and then it was like, and I see my accountant just lighting up. He's like, this is great. Like, you know, <laughs> good for your lifestyle, good for your health, good for your bank balance. And I'm sort of there going, uh, <laughs> no, I wanna, I wanna, Not I wanna China. work on that Phoebe Bridges next record. Yeah, right. That right. I was, you know, yeah, like yeah. listening to the last one. Yeah. I want to bring whatever one percent I can to so push that record. Ethan, if you hear me, yeah. to the next level. Yeah, yeah we're yeah, we're yeah. on our <laughs> knees here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're no, but I mean that's my dream. That's my mm. ambition in yep. terms of my mm. in terms of unlocking my ability. And it's like it's like my discomfort with my body. I feel the last thing I want to do is dance. So clearly, I need to go and take dance classes. Of course, right? Yeah. Okay, so well, this, yeah, I have. I, I just want to keep going on this because, um, though that was the most beautiful response to my uh, my push on you, I think what I was referring to is slightly different. Okay, um, I think I was referring to in doubling down into your artistic endeavors and dreams as a um, as a mastering engineer, the moves you make can be artfully technical. Yes. Right? I mean, this that's is the... A, that's your back... I mean, you have that background. Yeah. Yeah. To um, be leveraged. And so do I, in right? That moment. So yeah. I think, I think emotionally through, which I don't talk about out loud, and I feel insecure even talking about it on this um, microphone here, but I think about emotion in frequencies. That's how I, I hear music. I hear music in bands of of, um, of frequencies, okay, right? Like so an orchestra, of energy, like an orchestra. Like an orchestra. Like yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, like an yeah, orchestra. Yeah, yeah. It's how I've heard it my whole life, but it's visual to me. Um, and I'm not synesthetic. I don't necessarily see colors when I hear it, but I see colors when I hear it. At the same mm -hmm. time, it's just not um, actually like biological. And you know, if someone, if an artist says to me, "I want the bridge to feel more purple," I know exactly what that means. Like, mm. I could definitely sculpt that out with an H three thousand, and and you know, with some tools to make it feel more purple. But I'm doubling down on my technical ability to be artful and creative when asked for. Yes. So that's what I was talking about with you. Is yeah. don't uh, I don't imagine you're in the in the mastering studio like trying to experiment with a new thing on every song all the time. Like that's yeah. not how I view you at all. I mean, and I'm sure you do to some degree. We all do, but I was talking about using the same six plugins I used yesterday today on the same mix yeah. just to efficiently get the song to where it needed to be, where I heard it in my head from the first listen, right? That's yeah. that's what we're doing. But I don't, I actually don't think anything I did yesterday felt, felt, again, you can argue that all of the moves are technical. Nothing felt technical, but I definitely allowed the technique and my awareness and preparation of the technique to um, outwardly feel artistic. No, yeah. You know? No, no question. I mean, uh, that, that, that's something I can't help doing. So, you know, I, right. I, I'm, what comes to mind is our conversation about, you know, minimum phase EQ versus linear phase. Mm -hmm. And the rabbit hole I went down to understand why I didn't like how certain things felt and why people that I, you know, who are supposed to be smart in this business are like, no, you must use linear phase. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it, feels, it feels shitty. It feels mushy. It feels whooshy. It feels slow. It, it, slow. it, it loses snap. And then sort of, you know, drilling down and understanding the technical underpinnings. And now I can make decisions about how I filter on oversampling. You know, when I clip, 
mostly I need to filter after. Mm -hmm. And I can deploy a linear phase with a certain number of taps or a minimum phase with a, with a certain slope. And I can do that as effortlessly as I would move from a G to a C chord on yeah, a guitar. It's foundation. Yeah. It's, so now, does, do you need that to make good records? Clearly not. But that is a... That is a Probability uh, enhancer? Yes. Well, you know, it's just, for me, I just feel it's me. It's like mm. my, it's using my technical brain and my curiosity about how these things work, why they work. But it's a probability enhancer from the point of view of the person hiring you. They're I not going to so. hire you. From, I hope so. And from the point yeah. of view of Rory. Sure. Yeah, well, so. it can be. He's not necessarily saying that, but yes. Yeah, so I hope yeah, so. Yeah, but I think the system, like the idea of building systems around um, around ourselves. So, uh, you know, the know thyself thing that keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. Um if, if, you know, for instance, Roy is recognizing a tendency to be in sort of a complex mode, a biological mode, while trying to listen transparently to mm -hmm. music, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And noticing it just keeps happening. So he's trying to build a, a system that's like a prosthetic for his behavior. It's like a... Like a um, uh, and it, it's like an, a behavioral extension of your mind, right? So that you are caused to do the behavior that you are trying to accomplish with your will, mm -hmm. right? So you're trying to create a physical cue or a posture cue or some kind of cue um, to control the thing that you're not controlling on yeah. your own. The way John's describing, you just compartmentalize, go into the frame of mind and switch out of the frame of mind. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to cause that through external stimuli. It's like adding a system on to yes. your mind yeah. and, uh, and building systems around us. And that's really the essence of what the workflow Yeah, and acknowledging, question is. Acknowledging my weakness. I think about, you know, I, I try and walk from the studio four or five times a week, I have a loop that I do that, mm -hmm. you know, can be 50 minutes, depending on how many blocks I add to an hour. Um, and there's two modes. There is bring the phone, call family or a friend, bring the phone, listen to a podcast, leave the phone behind. Mm -hmm. Once you leave the phone behind, that's it. You can't, I, I, I'm never, I've never gone back for it, you know. I have the but same you, three modes. You, yeah, yeah. And you, I try to be deliberate mm -hmm. about it. There's days when I absolutely, I'm twitchy and I want to, dig into, I want to listen to something. I want to, I want to distract myself. It's like, now you're going to fucking go and sit in this twitchiness mm -hmm. or walk in it. We're, no phone. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's Walking gonna, in it's, it's easier. You know, um, and is. I think about the amount, if you start my text thread with my wife for the, the phrase, got to stay in it. So, you know, Sydney and I will be talking and she'll say, well, you know, what are we going to do about putting tires on the car tomorrow? Cause it, you know, they're bad, whatever. And I'll say, you know, I'm working, got to stay in it. And it's just like, yeah, I love but, that. The, but, but the, but really what, really needs to happen is the phone goes on silent and stays in the lounge, which I do maybe a quarter of the time. And mm. um, then, then I don't have to, you know, engage and shut down my wife and yeah. be left with the lingering sort of overlo overhead of, fuck it, that last time I dealt with that guy, he was a prick, he tried to screw me on the tires. Mm. Uh, what, how are we going to get the girls to whatever when we've only got one car, you know? Yeah, it's just, you're in it. The, there's a certain number of clock cycles that are, that are t taken. By valid concerns, just it, at the wrong time. Yeah, totally. They yeah. need. I, we need to right. put tires in the car. Yeah. I just don't need to be thinking about it when I'm right. listening to a. It's getting. To a, it's getting in the way of that feeding thing you're doing for yeah. your family. It is, and yeah. for someone else, exactly. there are there are engineers we know who could have, you know, Jocko shouting in one ear and Megadeth playing in the other, and bright flashing lights, and they would just lock in on what the vocal needs and just do it. Like certain people seem to be immune to 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 distraction or there are people mm -hmm. who, who are texting and mixing and you're like, that's amazing that you can do that. Uh, I'd like to somehow model uh, the specialization. Uh, um, when do you choose to do what people pay you for? Um, or sorry, that's kind of a solution to it. Uh, Tony always told me a story uh, or he would ask me the question, um, because I, I, you know, he wanted me to produce and I wanted to mix records. Uh, as a mix engineer, he told me not to mix records. Still blows my mind why he did that. I don't think, um, I think he saw the future of mixing being less than I see it now. Um, and he could be right in the long run. And uh, with Isotope and AI mixing, like that could 
yeah. put me out of business for sure. So he could be He's correct. He's definitely thinking long term. He was thinking long term conversations back then. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I always wanted to be a mixer, so I always kept that kind of in the back. And he would ask me you know, what do people pay you for? That's what you do. And I was like, dude, you're telling me not to mix, but I'm only getting paid to mix. I haven't had one production cut that came out, pay me any money. Like, I think I made $825 off of one production song at the time of that conversation that him and I were having. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but I get mixes every week. You give me mixes. I do mixes with and for you. Like, this is actually happening real time. Um, But it wasn't till... Four, four years ago to this day where I said out loud, probably to Spider Michael out loud, I'm doubling down on mixing. I'm going to be yeah, I was the, there. the best mixer that I can be. They're, that very separate than I'm going to be the best mixer. I hope there's a lot of best mixers yes. in the world, right? Um, I hope all my peers and uh, competitor, friendly competitors become the best that they possibly can be and I hope I can help with that to some degree. Um, but I made a distinct choice and I don't know, I don't necessarily know why um, I made that choice. And I, I mean, I'd love to know, Rory, when you decided to, I mean, kind of, you you left PMC after I've known you working there for so long. You said, I'm going to be a mastering engineer and kind of calling you out again in this conversation because you were just discussing, uh, you know, your holdups in the artistic and the technical uh, problems and the cooperation of those two in there. When did you say, I'm going to just do mastering? And why did you say that? Wow. There's so many aspects to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I said I was just going to do mastering when I moved here, um, mm. when I moved to LA. So I, you know, I'm 44. I recorded my first paid session when I was 18 in my brother's studio. Uh, had been recording four track and eight track stuff up and, until then. So between, you know, started playing music at 15, four track recordings, probably started doing eight track, eight at stuff in, you know, when I was 17 and uh, first paid session, 18, may, yeah, 18. Um, and, uh, and have been doing it in some form. Did a lot of live sound, played in bands, a lot of summer gigs, did some touring, small tours, a um, lot of TV work. Uh, sort of stage managing, production managing, TV shoots that we've You've done about. everything. Done a lot of stuff. Um, mostly made most of my living recording and mixing uh, for the time that I lived in Ireland. So at the age of 34-ish, we moved to LA and very quickly because of, so um, had no real idea what LA, how it was, how it was going to work who was, you know, I didn't really know why people were good or what made someone good. I, what I had was, you know, a bunch of hard-worn, you know, knowledge, yeah, not a bunch, a very small amount of hard-worn knowledge from making a lot of mistakes and going down a lot of blind alleys. And, and Spider and I talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and I had records that I loved and really no idea what made them sound so good because I hadn't been able to make a record that sounded that good mm. or felt that good. I had some stuff that was okay, but really I hadn't hit the mark yet. So came here in many ways, very naive for someone who'd been doing it so long. Um, and, you know, Maurice who runs PMC um, was a friend from Ireland and I started doing some work part-time for PMC, which immediately got me in the room with everyone. Yeah. So, you know, within a few years, I'm regularly at Rich Costi's place. I'm, you know, having dinner with Andrew Sheps and, and on and on and on, you know. And, um, and very quickly, I was meeting people who were A-list at what they did, um, mixing, recording, uh, but also people who were much younger than me, who were mm. better than I would ever be if I did it every day until I died. You know, just meeting younger engineers who are like, oh, yeah, savants. if yes. I just mixed and just did it until I died, and if I took the, the kindest view of my talent and my willingness to work, I would never be as good at this ki- as this kid, right? Um, so just sort of acknowledging limitations, <laughs> like... Sorry, that's <laughs> too much. Like I would never, I would never try and, and uh, you know, become a 100-meter sprinter. Mm. I know my limits. But in mixing, you know, 
say, for example, I was becoming aware of my limits. Okay. So I was listening to these records in Ireland. I love them. What makes them good? I don't know. Be- becoming aware of your limits. That's really yeah. interesting. Just... Come, yeah. Come here and see people. Yeah. You know, I got to sit um, in the room with um, Al Schmidt mixing Paul McCartney and just watching that dude push faders. Mm. It's just like, there, there you go. That's a college degree right there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't mean that I want to listen to Paul McCartney records, but watching him move through mm-hmm. the material and, and how he was doing it. Um, so anyway, it became very clear that a lot of things weren't for me. And I had been doing more and more mastering in Ireland and realized that I had an intuition for it. And I sort of was able to verbalize, I will never be as good at recording. I'm certainly not a producer. I'll never be as good at recording as these people. I'll never be as good at mixing as these people. But I had this sort of nagging feeling that even my heroes in the mastering world, it was like, I don't know. I think if I fucking spent enough time, I could give these guys a run for their money. Mm. Now, Ooh, that's a good feeling. Enough time. Um, I have a lot to learn. Um, and I've got to get really good mixes under my... Right, right, under, right. You know, it, I was going to say under my faders, but, uh, you know, in front of me to yeah. work on, to know. But I had this intuition. Yeah. So that's really mm. why... And then we're into the... Why I started groaning when you asked the question is we're into the much more complicated... When I, when I was thinking about, you know, our topic, we decided we talk about specialization this week and when to specialize. The much more complicated question is when there's, there's when to specialize. And there's another question, which is when are you allowed to specialize? When is it possible to specialize? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, for me, I had um, my first daughter, we brought home uh she's nine in a couple of days so six years ago uh, i'm here 10 years so very quickly we were we were we were doing ivf um to get pregnant that didn't work yeah. we we came to adoption ivf is extraordinarily expensive came to adoption yeah. which is extraordinarily expensive and time consuming um emotionally and also the most worthwhile thing we've ever done um and i needed um not to be taking risks financially and as soon as our first kid came home my wife gave up a really good job with all the benefits and, mm. and, and 401k and amazing healthcare and a great salary to be home with our kids, mm. a kid at the time. So I needed to make a living and made the call that, that I would split my time between mastering, but I wouldn't lose the regular gig. So I, I, I did, you know, in various times, anything from a day and a half to three days a week with PMC, which if you speak PMC means you pretty much do it 24-7. Yeah. And then I mastered records too. Um, and that um, is this, you know, I sort of hate the, the phrase double-edged sword, but it's been this incredible gift and this incredible limit on exploring my ability. So I got, I, I sort of got to listen with almost everyone on my dream list of who can I get in the room with and understand how they listen. Mm. I got to stand shoulder to shoulder with them and hear how they hear. Um, you know, so I learned a ton about listening. I learned a ton about technical stuff. Yeah. Um, I got to hear music, every kind of music in every kind of room. But the actual time, and more importantly, the mental space I had, given, given our previous conversation about my, my sort of limits, yeah. my reaction to that 40 milligrams, the mental space I had available from my phone not blowing up to just the, the, the processing overhead of my day job, um, certainly limited my growth in mastering. Right. So an example that I would often give is, you know, I met Dale early on through Spider's introduction when I came to LA. And I remember saying this to Maurice when I when I left PMC, you know, Dale had spent every day since I met him in the chair mastering records, yeah. getting better. Yeah. And I didn't. Now, did I develop skills that Dale doesn't have that maybe I can I can find some circuitous route back to applying on records? Of course. I definitely of course. did. Yeah. But Dale's just been fucking doing it yeah. every day. And and his output shows it, right? Yeah. And my output shows my lack of flight hours uh, relative. I've still done, I've mastered thousands of records. Yeah, I mean, right. you know, thousands. Uh, but Dale's mastered thousands more. More, yeah. Because every day so, I was out doing PMC, he was just in the chair. So, okay, so that's, a, I mean, that's one of the models I was hoping to to bring up today because that's, that's a model of someone who simply can't afford to go all in to their creative endeavors, right? Just kind of simply can't do it. Other yeah, financial I could, obstacles. Maybe I could have. And the, but, but yeah, we should. I we, think day jobs are a different question. 
um, I think the specialization thing is which type of engineer you. Yeah, no, be. but I know I, I love yeah, I, mean, I love that as as a version. Then I'm going to bring it back to work, that exactly. Work, so, work. Um, I was thinking about being in the room as a co-producer and a team, and one person would, you know, my partner would play a sick guitar part, and uh, I would fuck it up i would play with it i'd mess with it and then you know like a week goes by and then the guitar gets plugged in again oh dude do that thing that you did to that thing make it sound like that again it's like okay cool so all of a sudden you're being put in this box in this place of you're the guy who makes things sound like a certain thing and then to me that's that's a sound designer but it's also an engineer it's like you keep getting pushed into a direction you're going to start to think that you're that you're going to be that thing um and i think there's a lot of people in LA, New York, and in the, the co-production world that they happen to be engineers, right? They're actually, um, and this is my this is my story, so this is why it's really fresh to me, is that I was always an engineer brain. We, we can go all the way back to uh, starting as a recording engineer, but that's irrelevant for this, this model, is people start asking you to do a thing and you double down into that thing and it makes you better at that thing. So then you kind of just keep going down that path. And you can wind up becoming an engineer or you can be a producer, but I'm wondering at what moment is it time to make that pivot when you are doing it every day, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're in the room and you've been doing it for 15 years, but you're still good at both, but you're not great at either. Well, what were the considerations that, that you a, went through? Such a tight phrase. You're st you're good at both, but not great, not great at, at either. Not either. Yeah, either. exactly. Um, Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you. Yeah. Else. You repeat yourself. Uh, what did I say? Uh, sorry, I don't know because that was a real up. gem and it bounced around in my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, my fault there. I no, just, that's no. really well, just like what, tight what, language. What, what was that? Yeah. What was that moment? Right. No, that. Oh, what 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 were the considerations for you at that moment? Like, um, there was certain amount of income well, projected. I, I relate, there were various considerations. I relate highly to Rory's quick pushback that we didn't go down the the path of, which he said. Well, I could have. Like, I definitely was, I didn't have kids. Um, I mean, I was poor the whole time. I mean, I just didn't, I mean, barely could make rent, right? I had just enough money for rent. And we always talk about Paquito Moss. Like, it was just rice and beans every night. So, but do I want people to live that struggle? Like, I don't know, coming out the other side of it, I don't know if that did me good. I don't know how much of that did yeah, me good, right? I, I mean, it, Not. I'm where I am because of what, I did, of course. It's the only way things could be because I don't believe that we could have done anything else than what is, than right? Than what we did. Than what we did. <laughs> um, but I could have um, I could have chosen to tune vocals uh, mm. for a living uh, as a quote-unquote day job, still in the chair, still in the room. I could have done that, but no. Instead, I kept hustling for mixes or I kept trying to make beats and try to be a producer. Mm. But I don't. I don't really know. I don't have a solid answer so to your question. There's, a, there's an overlay. I'm sort of obsessed with this idea of, you know, lately of, in in many of our bigger conversations about about the moment in history and and <laughs> stuff we're struggling with, and conversations with, with the with, moment with my wife. Yeah, this current moment. Yeah. Uh, the I you know where everything seems to be getting pushed into black or white or or, or binary thinking, um. And this idea of overlays and the and the overlay that I'm putting on this story you're telling is your incredible um your your deft is the wrong word. Your your mm. social skills, your ability to move quickly and lightly mm. um, in mm. in in conversation, particularly um written conversation, which is the mode of the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in in 50 years my kids will just be, you know sending thoughts to each other, right, or to their clients. Mm -hmm. But in the current framework, you're, you're operating uh, very deftly at the speed of your clients, mm -hmm. at the speed of their, of their emotions and their needs. And when I overlay that on, you know, I'm good at both, but I'm not great at either, it's like it, it, it sort of, it weights the scale in one direction i, I saw that's a, that's yeah that's a good point and it kind of um goes back to what spider was asking me as well i think i saw a moment in uh in time where most of the producers that i was being put in the room with lacked one specific thing and it was they didn't know how to finish the records that they were creating mm -hmm. right they just had no idea i don't even know if they 
they wanted to. I could. It wasn't even obvious that they wanted to finish them. <laughs> no, seriously, there was so great, there yeah. was so much greatness being created by some of my collaborators, like things that I could never make on my own, and I wouldn't even pretend like I could. Like just wonderful things. That's like, nah, it's okay. And I'm like, wait, I I being a mixer still the entire time, I would be hearing really shitty things. Like I was at a place in my mix career where I was mixing just jack shit, like just you know, fucking brothers, friends, sisters, boy, boyfriends, band, like what, whatever mm -hmm. the circumstance is, just not good uh, fundamentally. And they, we'd be creating magic in here. The artists would love it, but the producers could never finish it, whether it was lack of enthusiasm or lack of technical skill. I have both of those things. Lack if of vision, you, maybe? Yeah, maybe maybe lack of vision. Mm. I, I, I can say for myself, as if you can't tell from my voice right now, I, I definitely don't lack enthusiasm <laughs> and I, I have a, a high technical ability in my craft. Um, you could converge and they couldn't. Sure. I, I can also diverge, but I'd see more value of me being the converger in the room. Um, and I think that's something that, I, 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 again, I'm not good at using that language. You're the funnel. But I'm realizing that now yeah. that if those are the words that describe that scenario best, hmm. I realized that it's, it's cool for me to be the converger. Like I have to put that kind of cool factor into it because I only thought producer was cool because they're creating everything and the mixer is just like cleaning it up or tightening it up and you know i'm like no 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 i'm refocusing things like i'm actually soundscaping and sound designing and sculpting the the emotional uh space and spirit of this it record sounds like people came to you for your processing style like your mm. personal style and the way that you do it i'm mm -hmm. i'm having a realization like as we're talking that when i when i did this overlay Example, I have to always imagine sort of like, you know, green plexiglass over over red and, and sort of how the how mm -hmm. you, you see the or the patterns or whatever. But I'm having this realization that your mix, your mix style is is a lot like your conversational style, which is you often you often jump ahead when conversation is, you know, is um bouncing around maybe it's divergent maybe it's exploratory you often jump ahead and pull the conversation forward in mm -hmm. a text thread or in a mm -hmm. in in the room it's like yeah wait okay you should have great. seen him playing Boom. poker you... at this table well yeah he oh. moved that fucking thing around the table like everybody hated until me. all the everybody. money was in front of him I he moved the whole table like, <laughs> everybody hated me pushed the game along i, I was actually was told crazy. i wasn't getting invited back to poker night you, you yeah. weren't fun but but your Almost mixed style vicious. competitive fucking vicious <laughs> your your conversational style, you kind of have a, a vision for where it can go. Mm. Wait, okay, let's go, let's grab this thing and go, boom, forward, let's pull it forward. And, um, you know, and, uh, and my conversational style is different. It's a little more languid and a little bit more kind yeah. of, let's go down that alley and see what's mm -hmm. down there. Oh, a dead guy, whatever. And mine's, like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. And yeah. let's look at this thing really closely right. yeah, for a right, long right. time. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, but, but anyway, yeah. That's Michael and I are aligned in so many of these ways. It's yeah. so fantastic. I love it. That's, I don't know. It's beautiful. I need to have someone like that on my side. <laughs> uh, what's, I just want to get you done. What's going on over there? I want to get you done. What do you, what do you got there? My conversation style is uh, on the paper. Hmm. Uh, like I have conversations. Not that's not a paper. That looks like iPad paper. with a it's live animation. With a magic pen. It's they live animation. <laughs> what podcast has live animation? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm thinking of some factors as we're talking about specialization and um, just sort of what goes into specializing. There's a few things I wanted to bring up just to kind of stir up the conversation a little bit. There's one part of this where it feels like in this conversation, are we talking about specialization in terms of going f solo, freelancing in a specific area or being a specialist in at a studio? Like it, are we talking broadly for all specialization in any sort of niche or are we leaning more towards freelancing? Just wanted to clear that a, up a little bit. I think it's a narrowing. Like if mm -hmm. you think about, um, uh, you know, track and field, mm -hmm. you can't be great at all of those things. Right. It takes mm -hmm. like different body types, yeah. different personalities, whatever. And so you might be really good when you're in elementary school and, and uh, you know, junior high, high school, but at a certain point to compete at high levels, you have to focus mm -hmm. on, you know, running and then a specific race, you know, if you're going to get mm -hmm. a medal, 
Right. Yeah. So that's that's what I think we mean. So we're speaking about specialization in terms of narrowing. Oh, right. No, I understand yeah. the definition. I mean more so the application of specialization in this conversation. Are we speaking to freelancers in the music industry? Well, in, in the vein that Spider just did with his example, what what do you mean? What is the opposite? Because I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Sure. Well, there's people that could mix in a studio, like be part of a it's studio. Not really I don't think a it thing has, anymore. Yeah. I think it only has mm -hmm. to do with what you do every day. Yeah. Like for, cool. as, as a practitioner. I know right. what you're saying though, yeah. because yeah. Um, there. I mean, there still are in-house engineers. Right. I, I would. I'd like to note their existence mm -hmm. and um, wish wish them luck in the studio yeah. system. But most yeah. most most you, engineers want to get out of wanna, the, the studio. You should so know where I the think, exits are and, yeah. the, and the lifeboats because yeah. it's yeah. it's going to get ugly. So, but to, to answer yeah. your question specifically, mm -hmm. I think yes, that exists. But we're talking about cool. the freelance. But I don't think going solo. You said that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about me going solo. I think. I could have stayed in a collaborative mm. partnership as the engineer in mm. a co-production realm mm. um, and still found my piece with being cool. specialized in the engineer role of that um, that duo. Yeah. yeah, I just thought it was worth clarifying. Yeah, for no, no, definitely. And thinking about it in terms of personal development. I actually don't, honestly, as much as I want to go down that and stir it up, there's so much in in that distinction that is so relevant right now because mm. there's so many producer duos and mm. trio groups and the the person that is sitting and commanding the computer the majority of the time, I would argue is the engineer. No, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Um, and he or she may think that they need to apply more affect to the record than they do naturally to feel like they're a producer in the room mm. um, and they feel like they belong in the room and especially in writing rooms and um, production rooms with the artists and, the, and there's co-writers in the room that that role is still blurred to me because people say that they're producers but I've been in with them and I am one I was an engineer in those rooms who also produced but I was hired or brought into it as the engineer. So either way, what what you're bringing and trying to distill it down even further, either way, I think I would have, I should have, which I did, chose to be the engineer mm. who can produce. Mm. Then there are producers that can engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Um, there are savants that can do both of those greatly. I would still argue they shouldn't just based on perspective and the ability to see it from the outside that doesn't mean that the producer who is not the um, engineer that can also produce can't sit down at the computer and manipulate drum sounds and nudge them around because they just hear the groove the right way and they just want to do it doesn't mean you have to be beholden to that computer as the engineer that's the part of just feeling like you belong and you're going with the ebb and flow of the uh, um, of the vibe in the room but at the end of the day you're being fall um um your fall back on as that role in the room so you always know your place. And I think that's worthy of talking about doubling down on and specializing in, yeah. um, especially in groups, Re not only solo. Related to that, I'm, I just wrote down fear slash resistance. Like yes. what is the what is the fear? I have some ideas of my own, but and I've been through this process of, of deciding to become a freelancer full time and, and specialize in design, but what do you think some of the fears or resistance of specializing are in the music industry? I, I mean, they, I, I, f I felt so many of them. So I had so much fear. I had fear every day in any session that I wasn't contributing lyrics. So therefore I was not a writer and I have a publishing deal. So I have to get X amount of percentage on a record to, you know, whatever, you know what it means to have a publishing deal. <laughs> <laughs> and but at the same time, I was creating the music and I was an equal part in that, but I couldn't see that because I was blinded by what I wasn't doing. So there's so much fear of doing the things that you're not doing. Um, even though you're doing something, I'm blinded by the things I'm not because I feel inadequate compared to that. Mm -hmm. And the resistance is met when that moment when you um, assert yourself and throw an idea out and it is not the best idea in the room, uh, so you are then told that your idea isn't good 
Um, so then you do it less and less and less as more ideas you throw out aren't as good as the other person's, even if objectively you're like, that was a shitty idea too, bro. Why did you, why did yours win? That's, that's besides yeah. the, that's besides the point. Yeah. Um, but the more and more you get, uh, you get that resistance in the room, um, you hibernate into that role, but then because you're in that role and you've been resisted, you don't do your best at that role. So then there's just this, uh, friction in the room and no one's doing their best work because it's just kind of glowing about in there mm. and i mean i'm just this is firsthand for me and this is my experience not the best vibe it's just not the and, best vibe and it's yeah. hard to hide from but that i wonder if um not in your case but in a situation like that um if you commit to too much mm. you're not going to do all of them to the level that you're happy with um feel confident in those situations be be driven and motivated to find better collaborators and whatever. Um, and so like maybe when you're younger and experimenting, you know, you are playing all kinds of roles and over committing in a way. And, and that's part, that's part of that process. Um, uh, well, part of me bringing yeah. this up um, tonight is to kind of see, I almost want to put a number on it, but Rory at the table makes it a little bit hard because you're really starting to double down on mastering at 44 years old or 43. I think it's year, flexible. Right? I think it, you it can, can go be in flex- and out. It, can, it can be. Um, yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's, you know, in audio work, in terms of studio work, all I've done is master for 10 years now. Yeah. Um, you know, I haven't, the last record I mixed was seven years ago. Um, I right. Haven't, I haven't recorded anything. Right. In six years, a songwriting session I did maybe no, pro, no before my kid came home seven years. Right, last time I recorded a vocal. Um, so as an audio engineer, you've been you've special you've specialized. Yes, you chose that yeah. a long time. Ago. Okay, so yeah, Michael's Michael's point or question sort of highlighted two things. There's the there's the and if it, it feels like related to our conversation last week, there's kind of a, a cascade of of specialization decisions so it's like Mm -hmm. i flip burgers and i write songs you know you know for those who dream to flip burgers i'm behind you i support you all the way but but let's assume that most of our audience are dream to write the song so at some point you say i'm going to go i'm going to do it so i'm just going to get into music full time so that's a kind of specialization decision i'm going to dedicate my life Mm. you know i'm not going to it's what what am i going to spend time getting better at yeah not my dad's auto yeah. shop right. not use maybe the degree i got in whatever you know accounting i just i want to do this right so there's that decision and then there's like okay so now now i'm one of these i played in a band i recorded our demos i recorded my friends i mm. write songs so you're one yeah, of those big kids, one. right lots of those so you've got to like you did you've got to sort of filter down through the cascade and and go producer engineer songwriter which am i yeah and then we get into genres and, and uh, yep. you know, so it's like, I love pop, but I'm, I play a lot of indie music and I produce indie bands, yeah. indie pop. And those pop represent different social yeah. circles. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And then I'm, I want to, I want to look back to Michael on the, on the fear question, but then within that, there are two, back to our tension, you know, the theme that I keep coming back to, there are two things in tension. One is you need to specialize you know, you can't be a guy who who produces or a girl who produces pop, rock, R and B, hip hop, trap. You know, you, you just can't. You know, it's classical. It's there's there's no one, almost no one who can who can genre hop with respect like that. So, you, in order to get known, I, I aspire to do that as a mixer. Epic. I mean, I, yeah, but I but really, of, in the in the music business we work in. There are very few people who do more than one genre well. Sure. Um, so you're you're in order to, it's not a prerequisite, but it's very normal to specialize to maximize your relationships and yes. your your flight time yes. uh, on a genre. So you focus on on hip hop, and then you focus on a particular type of hip hop. You know, you're you're sure. you tend to work with female artists or whatever. So there's this incentive, this drive to to focus. Mm-hmm. To to specialize, to specialize, to specialize, mm-hmm. um, and in order to find your voice, your niche, your pocket, mm, yeah. um, and and in doing so, you are also trapping yourself, um, of course. because as the as the the industry evolves maybe, around maybe, you, maybe uh, I think trapping is too strong, or you are limiting yourself. Limiting yourself. Mm-hmm. I think trapping is an interpretation. I mm. I've told you this story, but I remember being with um, 
Like I said, I, I used to, via PMC, do a lot of work at Rich Costi's place because he had a lot of speakers and he was always making changes. And and we were, I was in and out of there every, certainly every three months. Hmm. And Rich was working at, um, out of um, El Dorado Studios, amazing, giant control room. And um, at one point I was over there, he was working on uh, SSL 4000 for years and um, pretty heavily modded board, very vibey. He was doing a lot of rock records at the time. He was doing, you know, he'd done Muse, he'd done maybe Jane's Addiction at the time. And um, mm. and he had just started mixing a few. He'd done that Santi Gold record uh, that I really loved that mm. he mixed. Um, maybe that, anyway, one day I went over there and the 4,000 is gone. So I have this m mental image in my mind of who Rich Costi is, the kinds of records mm. he makes, um, the room that he works in, the gear, you know, he had two of everything mm. in the room. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what the fuck happened? Like, where is the, where is the console that fits the mental construct of Rich Costi that I have mm. in my mind? Where is it gone? Mm. And why is there an SSL 9000, which is not, doesn't compute with the picture I have of Rich in my mind. Right. It perfectly computed with the picture of where Rich was going mm. and of the, of the very deliberate, I mean, he explained all of this to me, but the very deliberate yeah. move he was making to, to unconstrain himself, to unlimit himself, to open a new avenue. Mm -hmm. So he had just mixed, um, just, maybe he mixed the Santi record at, at that time, but he had just done some stuff, um, not for Dre, for, um, anyway, another hip hop artist. And, uh, and was making moves in that direction. And also in his rock work, like we've talked about before, indie rock work, was looking to, as, as the low end of hip hop and R&B, bled out into every other genre, to jazz and to indie rock, and to yeah. suddenly we're like playing in the bottom octave, bottom two octaves way more than we ever had. Yeah. He needed a console that could keep up and keep it, bring that, you know. It was a fascinating conversation for me and a really great example of watching someone who was doing really well in his lane Mm. deliberately bust out of it mm. to to unlimit himself yeah um anyway that's just an aside mm. yeah. michael you mentioned fear yeah and, well, and you said you had you 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 had stories or or examples yeah um to me there was like a fear of of that uh that trapping slash limiting um i think that narrative was definitely in my head of um a fear of defining myself uh, and committing to this, this, uh, specialization, mm -hmm. right? Um, fear I, of commitment. Yeah. In a way, yeah. commitment, was, a career commitment. Specialization in your case, what, what does that mean with, in your design work? You know, it's interesting because as we're speaking about it, I'm like, I've kind of been committed to design since I was 15, mm -hmm. you know, um, first biggest commitment was going to college for it of finally after studying a bunch of other stuff and then um then just committed to it i was never like i i guess there was when i was younger this question of whether or not i would play in a band and go on tour forever or mm -hmm. as long as i could uh but, or but what kind of design we're talking yeah, about genres yeah right um so initially or roles even yeah right yeah yeah so big world out there it is you know and i think initially and to speak about the 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 progress and the process that it takes to get to specialization. Like initially I was like design as a concept is great. If I could do any form of graphic design, it's great. And then as I moved along in my career, you start seeing and being able to make predictions of what you think might happen. They're more informed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to say, well, right now I'm a graphic designer making an, a logo here and there or a, um, magazine, they're going out the window. I should probably look into focusing more on the web, which I had been doing for a while. Um, but I was like, but even that is sort of on the way out. iPad app, the iPad had like come out pretty recently. iPhones were had to come out also yeah, really recently. And I was like, okay, there's something there. And so I, uh, for several years, I mean, five, six years specialized in making products and apps, right? And that was a commitment. I didn't really have the fear there, um, actually. You had a clear role there. Yeah, I kind of knew that that's what I wanted to do um, at the time, and I specialized in, in at different companies building apps. And then um, I think more recently, it was, it was more about, I guess, specializing in being a freelancer, more so than specializing in a form of design that I was afraid of. I think that was... Um, but I think it's related. It's It's sort of your... 
deciding, okay, there's this other option and I want to try this and I think I could be good at it and I've got an indication that I am or could be um, and that commitment of deciding, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, so that's an interesting war, uh, sort of instance of where our worlds kind of break apart because in, so in design, there are tens of thousands of, of jobs in the US mm -hmm. where you can design for Ford or design for Apple or design for, mm -hmm. you know, Getty or whatever. Uh, in, in audio, there, aside from maybe post jobs and radio jobs, like broadcast, there aren't mm -hmm. on the creative side, right. the, the, the record making, uh, yeah, the record and the record making side, there aren't very many day jobs mm -hmm. left. And as, as we joked about earlier, yeah. th those uh, people will be looking for the exit soon, whatever's left. Right. Um, so that's, but in your world, that's a sort of a legitimate choice. And I imagine um, that a day job in design at a, at a company like Apple is probably a pretty good gig, yeah. you know, in terms of benefits and, and, and mm -hmm. payroll. So the, so the leap off the building, um, you want to know that you can fly, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the fear. We're talking about that moment right before you left. Yeah. Or maybe sure. after. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of both, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like in the air and I'm like, can I fly? <laughs> and, and oh, you can fly. I presume in the space of uh, in the uh, in the air, you're competing with people who who, in in terms of our specialization conversation, people who've defined a voice. Mm -hmm. So if I want um, very um, dangerous, mm. disruptive, mm. Uh, aggressive graphic design for tech. Yeah. You could probably tell me who that guy is or that right. girl is, right? Mm -hmm. And there are there are characters just like if you said, I want to make a I want to make this kind of record but with this flavor, mm. you know, give me give me the 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 R&B vibes with the Turkish psych. It's like we could probably name the guy, right? The who 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 would, you. Yeah, we would send you, you to, right? So, yeah. you're leaping off the building maybe before you know what your mm. voice is because like for me, it's hard to find your voice when you're out doing PMC all day, when you're setting mm. up speakers for other people's mm -hmm. record making. If you're at Ford, I don't know where your day gigs yeah, were. Yeah, take but a chance on yourself. Yeah, it, yeah. This, is, this is the thing. You're, yeah, that's the, I'm, yeah. I'm sort of interested in that moment. The of leap like, of faith. You've done it, and now you need to carve out your specialty and, right. and eat. Yeah, exactly. You have these. <laughs> and and like you said, the voice part, I think that's a, a third part of this. I yeah. think the specialty and your voice are different. It's the ultimate specialization. Uh, it's sort oh, of like oh, the oh, self-actualization oh. of yeah. specializing yeah, yeah. is your specialty voice. Specialty and voice are different. Definitely. I, I see them differently. Definitely. Yeah. So that's you, the next level. Because to me, I'm seeing, well, specialty could be I'm a logo designer, but I only do super aggressive logos for tech companies. That might be my voice. My voice is a more aggressive approach, all hand-drawn. Yeah. Whereas the specialty to me is specializing in a In the role you play. Specialty yeah. is almost genre. And so we could right. say no, hip-hop. It's, it's yeah. the role. It's, it's like the... Yeah. It's what you bring to role. the genre. Yeah. It's which part of the team you're on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. producer versus... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And your voice is like, that's even narrower. Now mm -hmm. you're trying to eliminate everyone. And then we, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that your voice is fully expressed in the role you're in. In that role. Which yeah. is, which is yeah. loops back around to John's point where, you know, if the, the lane's not do wide both, enough. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, yeah. you, you sort of, you see this, this ability to finish records emerging. You're looking around the room, you know, um, I remember that in a, in a, I remember early in my time in LA, really kind of just having no sense of what I was good at or not, or where, if there was a scale of, of zero to a hundred for like, see, I don't even know what you would have called a scale at that point, but like record making ability. Mm. I yeah. had no idea, was I coming in at 1.5 or 12? <laughs> I definitely knew I was getting in the room with people who were, yeah. Yeah. Who so were 90. People. You need yeah. people. But I had no idea. I mean, you know, I know I'm in the bottom half. I'm, I know I'm probably in the bottom, you know, a couple of decades, but I don't know what I know. And I remember being in the room early on, um, first couple of years, maybe the first or second time I was in Capital. And it's not record. It's back to our interesting tech thing that made me so uncomfortable earlier. But being in a room with probably six or eight people talking about a fairly ambitious technical project and something came up and the question, whatever it was, kind of baffled everyone. And I'm standing there going, you know, there was some smart people in the room and people that I assumed would know way more about the topic than me. 
And I was kind of just had this moment where it's like, oh shit. I'm the guy. I'm the guy in this room. Yeah. And I busted out with like, oh no, you know, it's to do with this and we do that. And then one of these, and then we'll add these two together and it'll make this happen. And no one cared or it wasn't important. It was like, it was just like, but it was a, a little moment for me of like, oh, I learned that. That was one of the blind alleys I went down in Ireland when I was trying to figure out such and such a problem. And it was useful here. Yeah. So it was this kind of integrating of my previous very inefficient explorations of what was possible of the space and plugging them into the world of LA, the pace of LA, the the talent level, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, plugging in my, and then sort of trying to, to build on that, you know? Yeah, and you, you figure out where you fit in. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I, what I want to get out in the open for engineers is in that moment when, I mean, I, I don't know if we've all been in the room when this has happened, but maybe maybe we all have. Um, the, the engineer is kind of talked down to, um, mm. like, Oh, oh, don't worry. You know, they'll fix it. It's like all they do is fix things. All they do is make the, oh, you know, he's just going to add 2K to this thing. He, like you call it the number, like the producer, the the tense, like uh, demeaning producer roles, like eh, devaluing like what the engineer does. And that happens all the time. The artist like, oh, they're not fast enough. They're not this. They're not that. And engineers are off, often not what they're supposed to be, but what they are at the same time. It's like, oh, he they didn't do this. They didn't do that. That wasn't, they weren't good enough for this. They weren't good enough for that. And they get kind of replaced in the room really fastly. They're fast. a commodity. Yeah. They're a commodity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so some of them might be, you know, some engineers might. We talked about that here in yeah. the conversation. So the implication in those situations is that producer or artist, I could do your job. I can get down and I can sit and, and boost 2K on the thing, but you can't do my job. Yeah. So there's a, we're into a kind of a caste system. We're into yes. a, 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 But a the levels. goal, the goal would be that you have to become indispensable, yes. right? In that role. And that's when, that's when I wonder how to kind of uh, show examples of how to recognize that, that, circumstance and oh, when that hits it's all so relationships good. This, this and is, we keep getting yeah, yeah. like how, so so then you can choose to go freelance like M michael's flying we know he can fly michael's smart enough to know that, that i'm going to try to fly now because i can fly like he knows that he can and he has headroom to do so so it's a decision that was made with some educated guess that the success is likely to occur and same with me after tony there was a huge drop of of workflow and I came out from Tony a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more overconfident than I probably should have been mm. when it comes to my rent. Because uh, <laughs> you're used to getting work from someone for so many years, then you're like, oh, but I got this one hit record, so I got it. And then all of a sudden no work comes because, oh shit, the filter of that work was Tony. Um, yes. You know, so, but when, when I made that move, I did feel like I could fly. Michael felt like he mm -hmm. could fly. We all feel like we mm -hmm. can fly at a certain time. Yeah. I had a very clear version of that I don't know if yours was very clear. It seems almost as clear, like when you were like, uh, I don't want to do this anymore and work for someone else. Oh, yeah. You know, you, you, it was it, clear. It was clear. <laughs> it was clear. Um, it's not always clear for people. So I'm wondering what that looks like. Of Oh, I'm noticed that people are coming to me for a thing. Uh, so I can now. It sounds help. like it's just, it's confidence. The, uh, and, the, and that confidence is a group. It's a group project. Mm. This is it. Beautiful. Yeah. Go. Mm. You you take it. But that's it. I mean, well, so <laughs> this, I mean, it's that simple. I mean, well, we, okay. We so figured it I out. I just said it. Well, here's here's. So when I talked about our conversation last week being being the least satisfactory in the room and the most satisfactory after, one of the things I was thinking about is how we how we use words and how certain words that mm. you used. Uh, made me uncomfortable. And then towards the end of the conversation, we got to why. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that I've often said is is like, you know, in reaction to something, is that 15-year-old me reacting to that or 44-year-old me? Mm -hmm. Like, so business speak, it's like, I'm not that guy. <laughs> I play indie rock. <laughs> it's like this childish sort of petulant uh, uh -huh. resistance right. to structure uh -huh. Uh -huh. when in fact it could be just a thing to help you fucking fly, exactly. right? Exactly. So anyway... <laughs> One of the words that, that was rattling around my head all week that's come up a bunch in our conversations is model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. I think it may have been me or it may have been Spider who sort of started using that a lot in our conversations about what this podcast would be, that we would model a type of conversation. And increasingly, I've been uncomfortable with it because 
it seems to imply that we're role models. Role models. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's interesting. I yeah. never think that way. Yeah. No, of course you don't. And, yeah. But why why that came to mind is because of Spider's admonition last week about the prescriptive thing, which which really landed for me. And of course, like of everyone here, I'm the least comfortable with any idea of being a role model because I just have I haven't got that Grammy and I don't have the hit record that, that you have, for example. Um, so I definitely would not consider myself to be a role model. So when I think about, so anyway, that was like all going on in my head this week. Mm. When I think about the model that we're sort of using very powerfully in this group, it is to find people and be very deliberate in the project of acknowledging strengths and weaknesses Mm -hmm. to create a space safe enough where and I'm trying to do it, you know, because I feel it's like the it's the it's the driver of my growth at the moment. Is call it when I feel I fucked up, or when I feel I'm, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, half the time you guys go, eh, yeah, you know, and it's just like, yeah, you did, mm-hmm. okay, cool. And the other time you're like, no, 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 hold on a second. When you said that and you think it was trash, and actually it was useful in this way, or it it, it illuminated this, right? Yeah. So it. I'm constantly getting this feedback from this group of people that I've that I've entered into this mm. thing with in yeah. this context, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, Spider and I have been very deliberate about this over the last couple of years. Um, as as two pegs that are neither round nor square, looking to define our our um, our place. Um, so, I guess all that to say that the how is to is to find some people, um, friends or not that you can start doing this process with yeah. um, and someone who will, who will make note of the fact that you're good at finishing and, um, mm. you know, or whatever it is. I think the, this, this, this operates at the level of career specialization. So um, a different version of Jocko's discipline equals freedom thing. It's commitment equals freedom. Mm. So meaning committed relationships allow you the opportunity to specialize, right? So in work, a producer and an engineer work together. Um, they can each get better at that thing mm-hmm. because they don't have to do both anymore. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So they have the time, sort of like uh, my relationship with John in, mm-hmm. the, in the projects we've done together. I'd never had to sit in front of the computer mm-hmm. again, Ever. learned all kinds of shit about myself, mm-hmm. right? And what, I, what I'm capable of. Yeah. Um, Beautiful thing. But also the next level, like Michael brought up the distinction between your your specialization, the role that you play in the team context um, uh, uh, is your voice. So this same commitment um, gives you the freedom um, and the feedback to find your voice. Okay. Michael, Michael see what I mean? What's your voice in graphic design? What because we're talking about it in the abstract and it's like, I don't, because yeah. I haven't seen enough of your work except for, yeah. the, for the stuff you do for John. It's what? interesting, great question. Um, I think it's sort of two parts. I'm really driven towards finding the simplest explanation of anything that I can find, whether that means like modeling it, diagramming it to figure out what the system looks like and then finding the the thing that needs to be communicated to someone. Mm. So. I think um, personally, I believe that all great design does that. Um, so part of my voice is really bringing out another person's voice. It's mm-hmm, kind of meta. Mm-hmm. It's like bringing out what they want to say, even though they don't. They might not even know exactly Producer. what they want to say. Transparent right? yeah. style. So I think that's one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do prefer projects that aren't very. Um, graphic designy like uh, less flourishes less kind of hmm. clutter and nonsense and shapes like I, I like simplicity on the graphic front because mm-hmm. the same way from a communication style I find that if you have a clear succinct message someone's going to understand it well all that visual information you're adding is also com- being communicated and decoded so I lean towards simplicity from a visual point of view as well. Hmm. And I think to me, it's like if you can communicate something with a square that's green and it says a paragraph worth of information, then great. Like why does it need to be green and 3D just because someone wanted 3D? So I I personally uh, kind of go to a... That's a bit more of um, 
And correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. That feels more like taste aesthetic, than a voice. Aesthetic, aesthetic yeah, framework. Yeah, it's more style than voice. And voice. But the voice, yeah, okay. the voice part, I would say, it's kind of, it, it's a difficult question to answer because I always find like, well, what's my client's voice? And how do exactly, I Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of that? like, what do I smell like? Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't exactly. smell like anything to me. Right. Okay, yeah. so that, okay, yeah. so that's really interesting yeah. because we we sort of Today I did that. I mean, I live with it. Well, like can, can you, you know. can you have an elevator pitch about yourself as a freelance designer or engineer or produce? Can you? I don't, I think I don't so. know. That's exactly what was on my mind. That's when, what you're yeah. wondering. When yeah. I asked Michael is, you know, and I think it's probably easier for you to give the elevator pitch on Michael than mm. it is for Michael. Yes. Um, and part of the part of the Part of the process, I think, of what we're trying to do for each other is bring that out, share it, own it in, in a kind of a space where where we're free to sort of play. Yeah. And mm, yeah. um and you know, I know that the story I tell about myself to myself and to others has not unlocked either my best work or massive financial success. So mm. that old story, I'm I'm good with letting it go. And I'm working out a new mm. story that I hope is more um in touch with reality and my ambition. Um, so I need your help. And yeah. that's, that's, why, uh, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And, and we've sort of uh, committed to making that conversation, the conversation, public, yeah. um, which is really great. Yeah, I mean, we're going to do this anyway. We might as well see if anybody can get any value from it. Mm. But thinking about what, what you two were both just saying, I actually think that, yeah, I could, I could probably... Mm tell you Michael's voice and describe him and his elevator pitch for him. But I can also now, because I've chosen to do what you did and try to write a new story, and it's a story kind of of a bit more confidence, I could tell, I could elevator pitch what I what I specialize in pretty yes. quickly in like less mm -hmm. than two sentences. I yeah. can tell you my, my, um, um, my focus that I exist in, my uh, want for dynamics and emotional connection to music. And I can just des describe mm. how I hear and want to hear music. And someone will say, cool, that's my guy or that's mm. not my guy, like pretty quickly. Right. I couldn't have done that a few years ago. So you're, mm. you, I think you're right in that uh, someone can also do, I mean, yeah, I would argue Spider can probably do it better for me just because, <laughs> but I can also do it adequately. And I think mm. everyone should be yeah. able to do that for themselves mm -hmm. and not in a sales way, in a very genuine, and this is, to me, this is Michael's voice. Mm -hmm. Michael's voice is, I'm going to distill down exactly what and who you are as a brand, not necessarily only as a human, but it's the productization of ourselves. And in order to get to that, um, that spe specialization and that place of specialization, we need to know what we're specialized in so we can choose to go down that path. And the only way to know that is to find out your true intentions and like mm. what you actually do in your voice. Mm. And right. that's what your voice is. Yeah. Your voice is yeah. finding that voice. Yeah, it's like watching Inception. <laughs> I feel like you explaining that is mm. <laughs> the, the, the ground is folding back over mm. this. It, it's meta. I mean, like yeah. my voice is finding people's voices. And I, mm. I, I'm, I'm only able mm. to say that because I think that's my voice. My voice is, he, <laughs> is he, as the engineers, in the background, you can call you can call an aesthetic and a sound like the fact that I mix with maybe less high mids than mm. someone and a bit more warmer and mm. a full sub octave bass. It's a yeah. description. That's an overlay because that'll yeah. change in time. Yes, yeah. ex exactly. You know, but Your the, Rich Cossie story. That's what I was thinking of. But the like, underpinnings are are the, the bedrock is truer this is the and fundamental more fundamental philosophy. Right? And yes. and you know what you know everything you're saying about both your roles. My elevator pitch, and I feel that I don't deliver it yet is to, you know, I get, I get the kind note from the client, oh my God, it sounds fucking amazing. And it's like, and often I'll write back, it was all in there. Exactly. Like I didn't, I didn't make it yeah, amazing. I, I love right, that one. Right. It's just like, you know, that was the uncut diamond mm -hmm. and I polished it a little, but, it, yeah. but it, you made that, not yes. me. Um, and my intuition is to, to hear it, to find it and to unveil it. And then, you know, as I often sort of tag at the end, it's like, and make sure it can hang on a playlist. Exactly. You know, exactly. It, Stand easy, the test of time. It's easy to make mm -hmm. a thing the, the more like it is, um, but to make it more like it is and make it mm -hmm. hang on a playlist, that's that's the trick. But also mm -hmm. what I'm hearing mm -hmm. from that, because I do this too uh, um, with the, oh, it was already there. You know, what you're doing with that is reshaping the team aspect of it. Like y'all did your part. So when someone t just happened right before we started recording, you killed this, John. And I wrote back, y'all killed this. Glad to be a part of it. You know, yeah. just like, 
the three of us, the producer, the artist, and I killed it. Mm -hmm. And when Dale gets the file to master it will next also week, be killed. it will also be killed. <laughs> More death. And someone, yeah. and, someone, <laughs> and someone will say, yo, Dale, you nailed this thing. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. he did. Mm -hmm. We all did as well. And I think that's what your language is doing is reminding. each other do it. Exa yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that, the the choice to go down a path a specialized path lets everybody be their best in the team and the team isn't always in the room i always come back to this it's like i was talking to tyler johnson about this like i don't understand why the the mixer isn't involved in the conversation earlier on in the process like sure. they're brought into it at the end sometimes six on an album it's mm -hmm. like with the team f three four or five people made this album and then like six people are mixing different records it's like we should be part of the same soccer team right like bringing in a member at the end of the team i always feel a little left out and i want to make sure that they know that i'm committed to finalizing their voice to allow or to make it known to them that this is their project and i'm definitely going to put a stamp on it i by default have these ears so i'm going to make decisions that are mm -hmm according to my aesthetic um, and if they align then great mm -hmm. but i'm always so flexible and malleable to at the end of the day what they want to a degree mm -hmm. there will be a point where i'm like well i'm not the guy for that which which is a jumping off point for another thought i had during the during the week yes, about please. about um this process of specializing um and how it might happen and it is you know in as you're as you're painting that picture of being brought in late I think about really effective teams where over time certain producers and writers will partner with a certain mixer exactly. and there's a shorthand that develops. We've often talked about it right. um, and it opens up flow and people stop having to, you know, write long emails or, mm -hmm. you know, it's like shorthand, you yep. know, more purple in the chorus, done, boom. Um, so there's value in that. I can think of examples where you're better for having worked, you're more specialized, you're more in touch with your ability, your unique voice for having worked with people over time. And then there's the kind of dice roll, you know, last minute session from producer, you had to Wikipedia, you know, and it's like, <laughs> who, who is this girl and, and what's she doing over there, you know? And it's like, in comes a challenge or a, a, or a texture or a rhythm or whatever that you, you haven't worked on before that, Mm. that sort of mm. makes you realize it's like, you know, maybe I didn't know I was any good at mastering whatever genre until I got that, that weird Ethiopian jazz record. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh shit, I kind of have a, an intuition from this because I played Irish folk music for 15 years. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm in tune with scratchy, weird, janky yeah. kind of beats and these, these sort of simple but complicated rhythms, whatever. Um, so you get, you get these kind of random inputs that, can jump you forward, you know, and then you get in the other situation, it's it's comfortable places that can help you develop. So I'm struck again by that tension, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Does that mean anything? Yeah. I'm still thinking about applying your voice to projects. Hmm. It's something I've never really ever thought about doing. I'm saying ever, I'm sounding super definitive about this. I, I can't recall a time where I've like went in with the expectation that I would apply my voice or that I should or mm. uh, or even thought about like my voice as like an element in the process uh, as much as the, like the other day we were talking about differentiation, what, what makes you different. It's like John kind of said it, triggered that thought, which was everything you do is different naturally. Like your ears are going to hear it differently. So you're going to approach it differently. And to me, that was like, that's about as much as my voice that needs to be there what am I really trying to do here, you know? And so it's interesting that we're talking about voice because I've never really thought about it as like, because it hasn't felt like a dominant element in my process, I haven't thought about about it that much. Well, mm -hmm. your voice yeah. your voice is inherent yeah. and what you do with it um, has an effect um, and impact, right? So you you're, you might do your best... Um, you might use your voice the best without anybody hearing it. Right. But your voice is in there inherently. Right. Like, there's just no way yeah, for it not exactly. to be. I guess that's kind of what you're saying. And I, I, that's why when you're asking someone like, what's your voice? Right. I mean, unless you're Adele 
uh, or Drake? Like, what's, what is your voice? I mean, there's well, plenty of people with a voice. voice is their product. But yeah. what is that, when someone says it, actually, fundamentally, when they're not the singer or the, the musician playing the part, I mean, you can say that John Coltrane mm. had a voice on the Do horns. you remember the guy who did, you remember the, um, those uh, Porsche ads from the 70s that we like? Mm -hmm. Super recognizable. Mm -hmm. When you go to those pages, you see this like long list of work that they produced, and it's very clear they had a voice. They had a voice, yeah, yeah got it. Yeah, of course. But yeah, is yeah. that just an aesthetic choice? Well, that's like, part of it. Yeah. That's part of the voice. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, more, it's, it's of the, I'm thinking more of the language that we're using and just breaking down what does the what is the voice yeah, mean what versus what is it. their taste and aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And I I'm hearing them kind of mm -hmm. being conflated. I think that's a part of it. Is it part There's of it? There's also yeah. the conceptual. It's, well, a, it's also what we do, what we what we like to do together at dinners is we break down these words and the utility of yeah. these words. Mm -hmm. Like, could you have great impact creatively without a voice, yes. but with good taste yes. and aesthetic, yeah. right? I right. think those are like, that's sort of the goal of the classical engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Morton mm -hmm. Lindbergh is that. Mm -hmm. He's more, yeah. Yeah, mm. but he's his so, I mean, his, his voice includes all of this, this musical taste. Mm -hmm. He sets the stage, so too. he's producing. Yeah, he's he's producing, doing more he's, than just engine, but his engineering mm -hmm. is like absent of I, color. Or we're just going to talk to Morton. That's all we're going to yeah. do. So I'm I'm remembering something that came up in the conversation here um, when we had the the in person conversations with everyone, which was this arc of when you're starting out being a service provider, mm. you know, yes, sir, whatever mm. you need, you yeah. know, oh, you, you want pickles mm. in that um, and you want more hi-hat, sure, who wants more hi-hat? No one wants more hi-hat, mm. whatever. Better, oh, you'd yeah. be surprised. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't, they're wrong. <laughs> Agreed. That's my prescription for the night. <laughs> um, so, you know, you go from that sort of service uh, mindset to even in the engineering mix space, people who are very artisan in their approach. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of a, a freedom to be artistic mm -hmm. in your service mm -hmm. that you earn. And I wonder, is there a similar arc? Mm -hmm. So that guy you're describing, Spider, I wish we had his name, the designer who did all those Porsche campaigns, mm -hmm. clearly had a, um, a strong voice, a strong aesthetic, A probably said no to more gigs than he said yes to, um, because otherwise he would have been co-opted into doing McDonald's ads, right? So he must have right. made choices. It's all this um, direct address question to the reader. Yeah, you know, it's very, it's I love, I, I know the style you mean. Specific style, yeah. but But I'm, what I'm sort of interested in exploring is this journey that people make, and not everyone does, like a post or you know, a broadcast engineer stays in service mode from start of career. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, correct me listeners, but stays in service mode from start to end of career, it's it's quite, yeah. you know, service is the best way of framing it. But um, someone like, um, thinking of mixers that have, that have very particular voices, you know what I mean? Where... An, Serban. Serban, I think, yeah. Yeah, it's very particular. Serban's voice is interesting. Sure, from a mile away. Yeah, you... you He's he's really unique to me in in how strong his voice is and how light his footprint is mm -hmm. in other ways. Uh, how well the songs mm -hmm. come through. I know you you, you yeah yeah. I don't know if I completely agree with you. Yeah, but you you feel he has strong sonic footprints. Oh yeah, yeah, the strongest. Really, I think so. Huh? I think he's the strongest. I think it's um. I I, I would characterize it. I always know a Serban mix, but I never miss the song because of it. As opposed to other engineers, mm. I could say, I know who mixed that. And all I can hear is the fact that he mixed it rather than the song. I definitely disagree with that. Oh, okay. Wholeheartedly. Okay, I wow. Miss, I miss the song a lot. Ah, um, interesting. Yeah, John, John is definitely kicked out of the vibe yeah. by people's engineering choices. Yeah, definitely. That's it's, interesting. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's, um, it usually has to do with by the last chorus or later in the song it's like he didn't realize the arrangement change and there's a hundred more tracks and he just left them all in there and like hitting a multi-band compressor or it something it just, it just gets mushy and then it's like um again this is no oh, this is such a good topic sorry this yeah. is no dis yeah. this yeah. is no disrespect to the no. greatness that is the success that he's had and um he's arguably one of probably my favorite mixer and the one I've followed for the longest and who is Jill Scott sounds very different than the most recent Lauv album that he contributed to. It just, it's a different, uh, it's a different version of that mixer. So the evolution changed. 
I, I, I'm thinking about the Wafia track. Am I saying that right? Wafia? Yeah, Wafia. Wafia. I'm thinking about the Wafia track that I, that I fell in love with. I can't even remember if we talked about it at dinner or, or on air. <laughs> but um, thinking about that and the restraint that you exercise in the mix. So there's a client for that restraint. Um, it's interesting when, when, you, when you describe, you know, of course, we're, we're characterizing and simplifying um, Serban's approach. But this, this thing that happens where start strong gets too busy, right? Let's just describe the, the, you know, too much stuff at the end, too mushy, too squashed, too, too yeah. right? Um, it's, a, it's a waiting choice. So the, there, um, you could say that there's clients who want the song to, to hit hard at the start, and they don't really care what happens at the end. And there are clients for whom... Who are those people? Um, I think there's... Who wrote a song and they don't care about the ending of it. I think there's actually that probably a lot of people. I mean, what? I've, I've made that... I've, I've, I've made one choice. So let, let me... Well, let then me, why do they put two extra tambourines in the third chorus? Oh, well, okay, give me to one... Li to lift it. That was, me, that was a choice. Give me one second to explore this, right? So okay. let's say they're... I'm with you the whole way. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to super simplify this. Um, you, let, let's, let's, yeah, you're a mixer who specializes in slightly lower levels, restrained for a really great payoff. So that Wafia track um, starts, I'm going to keep saying it weirder and weirder. Okay. Wa <laughs> Wafia. <laughs> like it's just going to get worse and worse the more I think about it. Um, but Sorry, the, Wafia. The, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the restraint required for the, for the payoff and for the build um, requires an artist and a producer um, with the confidence to say, you know, this thing is not going to come out um, on air or on a playlist. All guns blazing, super bright, super, super ear catching, ear candy. It's mm -hmm. going to be, it's going to draw you in. And of course, the no. sequel, the, the se well, bear with me. Sorry. The secret weapon is her voice, right? But anyway, that approach, or let's characterize and simplify Serban's approach to a strong, bright, present, um, open ear candy start, um, but there's nowhere to go. You've already used uh, zero to ten. You've already used all your available headroom, all your available um, uh, uh, capacity for brightness or whatever. However, you would characterize that, yeah. and there's nowhere left to go. So excitement. Towards, yeah. So towards the end of the song, it just becomes sometimes by the first over chord. the edge. Sure. Okay. So yeah, but I'm 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 sketching two extremes for a purpose. So is there? Let's imagine that that's true of Serban and true of you, super simple, and that you've both doubled down on it and you're owning it. There's a client for both. Agreed. Now, I, why I know Agreed. this is because I've been forced to take it from your aesthetic to the other aesthetic <laughs> way more times than I would like. So my intuition is to master a record, not at screaming level, and to really, really build it so that by the last chorus, it's paying off by the last double chorus, sure. right? I want that. I love the arc of the song. And I've, and I've had people say, you know, it's just not blowing my speakers up on bar one. Uh, can we turn it all up? Or can we make it all brighter? Or can we do whatever? And of course, the compromise is, you know, I'll, I'll play some tricks and we'll, we'll bring up the level and we'll, you know, we'll do some EQ moves and separate stages. Yep. But ultimately, people have forced me to go full Serban. No, just, just blow it up. I don't really, and I'll, but how far are we talking? Because when I'm, I'm, we're talking about that the Wafia song Hurricane is at min minus eight, minus eight point five. It's a loud mix. Not yeah, not level really. I'm talking more aesthetic, you know. Um, yeah. But it it's 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 a choice. It's loud. To, it's a choice to weight the mix uh, as short term, high impact, bright, um, or uh, longer term, slow burn, payoff later. Right, but you're but deeper, richer. You're you're, you're making you're making a um, your claim is highly specific in using the word bright, you can have impact in all frequency ranges, right? Of course. So you can have, whoa, listen to me in low end. You can have it in mid range. You can have it in high end. Mm. So there's, I, I know what you're doing and I know there's, a, there's specifically is it, is it a excitement or com commanding. Yeah. But you can have commanding in, again, in all frequency that's ranges. Why, that's why I'm not saying bright. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you can command. You can command the listener with a exactly yeah. with a feeling that you exactly. Yeah, and something so, that demands your so attention. So my 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 issue, and I'm 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 doing my best to not overstep um, boundaries here because I it's it's we there's so edit. much we can edit. Just go there and, mm -hmm. and and see what happens. I don't think that he's listening to the song. 
I don't think he's actually listening to the the the, the potential uh, of impact that the song could have. It sounds like it goes through a, a template of sorts. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one too. We all have one. Mine's very minimal. Uh, I imagine his is more. It sounds like it's uh, it's on everything, right? So when I hear uh, the EQ of Bruno Mars' voice and Ariana Grande's, they're in the same they're in the same range. It already sounds like it's on the radio. So that to me tells me that um, it's the same approach on everything, and let's see if it works, uh, and then we'll go from there. Versus, let me hear the song and determine what needs to be done to the song. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a uh, pre-processing. Yeah, pre-process and, and rewind from their um, methodology. And I would love to have him on the podcast and actually talk to him about mm-hmm. certain things, yeah. mm-hmm. less about technique and more just about overall approach like we're talking about. So yeah. I definitely feel confident in saying these things because it's actually how I feel and I'd love to know um, a response to that. I, th- I think... Um, specifically in our time now that people um, are more willing to listen to music uh, and connect to it emotionally and kind of craving for that emotional connection and not the, we heard the same thing over and over again, like we talked about Mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. And I think that the sonic spectrum that we could exist in uh, can offer that to us. Um, Allowing uh, trust and um, ex- exploration in the mix process by someone that is going to spend the time and and try things and, and diverge for quite a bit to find it. Um, and this is coming from someone that does both. I, I do, I have a template and some songs just need a little sparkle and um, a little top and bottom. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I definitely understand that point of view, but every once in a while, specifically with the song you're bringing up and like, I heard that song, I heard the rough mix and I said, this isn't done. Like, I know this isn't done. I know exactly where Digi wants it. Got on a call with him, talked to him about where he wanted it, and then took it there on yes. the first pass. That's an improv, too. There's just like a, a quick vocal thing that I think it was on my end, right? That was a, I understood it. Yeah. And I, I I wonder if that's what's happening in that in his world because I, I don't hear it. I don't feel it as a fan, as a fan of the music and of the, the technician at hand and the engineer. When I described sort of my insight into it from intuitively leaning your way and being forced as a, as a service business to go the other way, you know, which is the story of many mastering engineers, I'm sure. Um, I wonder at a certain point, there are, there are lots of mastering engineers who clearly decided to preempt the majority of their clients' needs and just bake it first time every time. And I could you know, we could use the rest of the hard drive space on me listing the names of those people, like who just first pass is always fucking blazing from downbeat one um, unlistenable, but the, the, um, you know, in terms of brightness, presence, but loudness. We, but the thing we do know, and I have worked with him as a producer, the thing we do know is that he does what he wants. And that's why we all love him. Like he is, a, he's assertive and he's confident and he gives people what they want, but he also does what he wants. So to close the loop, the fact that he serves labels and a and and radio, the radio intuition of out of the gates yes. on fire rather yes. than art. Yes, which also those people might be out of touch with what things are, are resonating with there's, kids. There's definitely too. lag in that It system. seems to no. me like he's serving the visceral aspects of the recording or like the the audience's bodies and not their minds. It's it's like, mm. it's that, uh, you know, I always just think of it as like um, geared up f- for the teenage experience. And it's, yeah. it's, the priority is to reach them, be in their world, engage their bodies. Yeah. Um, and that's more of the social utility of it. Mm. I think that, you see what I mean? I think that could be true. I think that's, and, it and sounds like I think that that's, is prioritized. Which overlays nicely with the labels and a and needs mm-hmm. for, for product that yeah. works yeah. effectively mm-hmm. in the world. Yeah. I think that's mm-hmm. very true. I think though those teenagers don't know any better, right? So if they were given a slightly richer and deeper groove to those elements that are just forced up against the glass with that approach, that they'd also respond to it. I agree. So I'm, is, I'm arguing that I understand why it works. Priority. I'm arguing that it could also work mm-hmm. another way. I no, agree. no, uh, it's just over the line. Know, we're in your team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, yeah. I know, we're, but I want to clarify yeah. that because yeah. I don't. Yes. I don't think that this is wrong. I don't think what he does is wrong. I think it's great. 
I think it works. I'm just a little tired of it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think other people are too. There's a, so I'm just challenging yeah. it. Yeah. And I mean, as your AirPods get better, exactly. You know, yeah. Start our, to tell our, the difference. Ooh, I had such a great listen today on AirPods walking outside to get the charcuterie board that we did eat tonight this mm-hmm. time. Ooh. Um, and it's just a mix I worked on all day, just on the same speakers, put in AirPods. And it just was like, oh man, the low end was just filling my body and yeah. it, it banged on speakers, but on AirPods, you could still hear it and feel it. And it was clean and open mm. and getting texts from the artist and a group thread and the producer, just how great it sounds. I'm just like, this is what it's all about. And it's all so bright. It's all so loud enough mm-hmm. and it's all, it's dense. It's just not like, over the line. It's not exactly. It's not over the line. Mm. Um, I, I yeah. Anyway, I could talk about this forever. Yeah, um, we, we will. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. I'm uh, a topic that I want to explore in the future is audio memory, and the fact that once you've listened to something at higher resolution, you can recall that when listening at lower resolution. So the mm. the fact that you've heard that track on the MBs on the big speakers here in the room, that as good as AirPods are, you're sort of imputing. An extra layer. It's the association with the full scale experience. You're, rec- you're recalling yeah. physiologically the, yeah. the the full scale experience. So mm-hmm. it uh, why why that's so important to 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 me obviously and Spider and I is that you know you you want people to get that that big experience so that they know what's possible yeah. um, and hopefully hear as much music as possible in that big experience so they can carry it forward in in their yeah. physiology. You know. Yeah, I love that. Um, Audio memory. We're going to talk. There's lots of stuff to talk about on that. Yeah, very cool. Um, very cool. Coming soon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, r- sorry, regarding this this conversation, I mean, clearly, our intuition, every conversation as we see it in the audio space right now, is very much um, serving more mainstream goals, and we're looking mm-hmm. to do something a little slower, darker, more of a build, more tension, pay off maybe in the last hour. Uh, honestly, you know? I, I, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know. <laughs> right. I know. I know what you're doing with that, and I, 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 re- I like it, and I respect it. I feel like a slight resentment from that tone of things might be objectively darker in the world that I want to exist in, but they're not dark. And I think that's something that I'm, as a mixer and as a, as someone hopefully that has a voice, um, yeah, or yeah. finding it, I don't. I don't want to put them against each other. I th- I actually know. You are the tension. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. I want to create the tension and I want them to coexist with each other. And I don't want someone to hear this and then hear that tone and say, that's what, that's the only thing that, the, um, not, not that's the only thing that he, that, that dude does, but like they won't hang together okay. on the same yeah. radio station because yes. that's, that's not true. That's not true. It's objectively not true because it has happened back to back back to back meaning on the radio next to like Serban and I and Tony and Manny and Ali and Jason and mm-hmm. all, you know, been on the radio at the same time in the back of an Uber and not one of them sounds any necessarily objectively better than the other. They all hang, they all sound great and they're all different approaches. And when that approach was um, so, necess- uh, so necessary from the A&R is a specific time when radio was dominating, right? And the majority of the successful songs out there that when I say successful, I mean that are actually making income for an artist and a, and a label. So that could be hundreds of millions of streams on Spotify that never get radio play. That's not the only way to have success as a mixer. So for the engineer that is listening to this and they identify super highly with the Serban approach or with mine, they're both great. And Sorry, I just referred to my mix approach as great. I want to hey, take that back. Why? No, that's, no, that's why. Not. It's, it's great. great. It was so it's, natural. It's working. I um, mean, it's We it were is. 10 years so sorry, for, sorry. You to, for you to be so <laughs> comfortable. No, no, that. no. What? <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. My point is they they both hang and they're they're both an aesthetic choice that one shouldn't be referred to as darker and slower than the other because I I care so much about the tempo that that's why I I um I go less on a on a compressed, held up vibe because that lets you feel the tempo as it is, right? And this visceral teenage it, yeah. response is a little bit faster than the tempo it's, actually is. It's right? caffeinated. It's, yeah. it's caffeinated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. we're we're sitting in um, it's hyper. We're sitting in California, Los Angeles, California during a pandemic, and the last thing we need is hyper right now. And there's going to be other times like this where the non-hyper, less tense, but still energy-driven and high high energy focus is going to be wanted and 
desired. In fact, is my argument. I actually think that people uh, will get a different and more substantial visceral reaction to music if it has just slightly more dynamics. And when you're talking about uh, there's a lot of bad records that have a lot of dynamics. I'm actually like, I have a very specific amount of dynamics and density combination that I actually think works. Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific, it's not an overall, like when I'm going on a, a live and I'm giving any sort of advice and I'm doing it here too, if I'm being prescriptive on technical advice, which I know we don't want to be on a philosophical level, but when it comes to uh, technical things, I think we have, we've talked about this. We have mm -hmm. a little bit of headroom. I think that there is a sweet spot for density and for dynamic and it's something that I'm I'm actually working on and I would like to master right because yeah. I think there's an objective place where that can exist it's a sweet spot yeah there is yeah, there a, is a sweet there's, spot. there's a sweet spot and, and it's, it's not some, it yeah but yeah. it is not dark and it's not slow no and I, I always want wanted this to, even when I was your, like just starting as an engineer it's yeah. like there's some sweet spot here. there is a sweet spot it's energetic and it doesn't hurt yeah and yeah. I don't and and I, I completely um, and I'm speaking to engineers like in this way and all, all of us when I talk about these things because we see a lot on Mix with the Masters, engineers taking out all this low end and leaving all of this high end because it gets louder. But when it gets louder, it loses all the sub frequencies that generate... Um, Satisfaction, yeah, or yeah, impact satisfaction, and impact in, the, in your in your yeah. in chord your, progressions, yeah, well, and yeah, it just gets rid of all of that. And that was the case when we were mixing one for vinyl, when the needle would literally skip off the record, and and, and you'd lose playback. Um, and then that changed on CDs, and even further now with with normalization on platforms, as we talk mm -hmm. about whether it's on or not is to be determined by your settings, but it's on for a lot of people and it's going to get turned down. So then you might as well have more low end to have the impact. And there's so much to think about here. so much to talk about, but I think there is a sweet spot that when you get lazy and strap on a compressor or a limiter and a ton of high end, you're boxing yourself into a zone that coexists with so many other things and lessens your chance of staying, uh, standing out. I think you make, a really good point and i sort of in 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 the spirit of bringing it back around to our topic and and maybe mm -hmm. closing out i sort of made a rookie mistake in in which was which was i defined you by your competition and it's it's you know mm -hmm. i sort of took serban as origin and then placed you in relation to him and that's a mistake mm -hmm. um you're you you just said it better than i can say it so the what I'm what I'm interested in for you know when we talk about the the, the philosophical conversation is um, you know when it what you're doing is oh where am I going with this the ultimately we don't want to be defined that you know by our competition and it's one of the word the, the reasons i'm so uncomfortable you know we, i think we talked about it in relation to something that we saw with the word compete this will help you yeah. to compete and it's like well mm -hmm. okay so if there's a scale of zero to ten for loudness and a scale of zero to ten for brightness and a scale of zero to ten for distortion and your competitor mm -hmm. uh, goes to ten on all three is the only way to beat her to to like, where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. So immediately this competition thing. I'll just jump in quickly and say, yeah, I'm not trying to compete with him or anybody else. I'm trying to hang with him. It needs to I'm hang trying to coexist. Uh, yeah, it needs to hang in the world on yeah. radio and on playlists. I'm not trying to right. compete with him. He, exactly. He's uncompetable. So, he's that, a legend. That's the that's <laughs> a mistake I sort of made in language mm. that that mm -hmm. that can have a parallel in in the in the business. Mm. Uh, I'm sort of putting you in relation to him with him as some sort of benchmark and you as darker and slower, right? Mistakenly, you know, and what you're, what you are is we would argue truer to the groove uh, in the record um, loud enough, uh, as bright as it needs to be, as distorted as brings out the, the, the sentiment of the song, right? Um, and all of that is just true, objectively true for you and your clients, regardless of where Serban is on the landscape. Sure. Um, and that's, you know, I, I'm hearing you is what, what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, and trying to make it, so, take a lesson from it, I guess. Yeah. Servant's great. Mm -hmm. He really is. I mean, yeah. there, every every now and then I, I hear a groove completely nailed, like the mix on 24 karat Bruno Mars is just one of the best mixes of modern day. I mean, it's just gigantic. 
His Uptown Funk mix is fantastic. Like there's so many fantastic mixes that that dude does where the groove is true and is true to the original. And if I imagine what the original would have sounded mm. like, it's it's every now and then it, it's um it's a spark of genuine uh, fanaticism for me and mm-hmm. and it's just they're few and far between at this point. And that's it's, that's what I'm trying to get at is it's less and I, that's what I want to talk about uh, with him would be that. I'm not listening with the critical mind of uh, trying to, you know, tear him down sonically. No, I'm just where, like, you know, it's not where we're coming from. Yeah. <laughs> but but it, at the same time, I want to be like, dude. I mean, I used to feel some crazy shit from you. Like, where'd it go? You know, where is it? And what's the intention now? And like, like Spider's bringing up, is this what you're trying to go for? This this sound, and you know, we can in, we can kind of end it there. Yeah, in a in a in a landscape that is so sort of hard to understand we often sort of judge our um movement forward or backwards or up or down left or right yes. in relation to other people but they're also all moving yes um, and it's very difficult to get your to know where you really stand in the business yeah. you know it, the quality of your work or you know there are people billing more than you but their stuff sounds worse there are people billing you know like it's a very yeah uh, qua- it could be doing quadruple the output um, as well with their team and they're not even necessarily touching it or they're spending less time because they don't have the amount of time. They're not a, an yep. A-list artist for that, for you hit <laughs> their level at the same time as like maybe they would be for someone like me yeah. or someone, uh, you know, that's a yeah. peer of mine. There's so many variables. So you, uh, who knows how noted they were to get it to where they, you know, from the artist. And yeah. there's so many variables here, of course. So back to Spiders, Ground Zero, Know Thyself and Forget how much 6K is on Serban's mix? Just what are you doing? Where are you headed? Yeah. You know, what do you want? What do your clients need? You know? Yeah. What does the record need? Yeah. Love those questions. I love thinking about them every time I sit down. Man, we talked a lot about specialization tonight. It's a topic that I don't, um, I don't know that's discussed and I don't know if there are any, if there are actually any answers uh, to it at all and and I just was around all week thinking no one told me when it was time to go and I think Michael brought that up a couple of weeks mm. ago which was someone's got to tell you to go I mean I I told you to come but someone else has to say go and you know I have a lot of people close to me at, specifically at this table that ha- edged me towards going but no one ever said it was time to go um, and I would again, kind of bring this back to that, getting around people that you really trust, I guess, right? Is that what we all did? We just around people that, you know, kept pushing, reinforcing and validating. And I I don't know. I think it's, it's like more I'm wondering what made me jump off the cliff and, and, it, and move and It's more choose. than that, I think, because you can be around a bunch of people you trust who are equally lost. Sure. And, and this landscape where mm-hmm. everything is moving, mm-hmm. uh, you need to, there needs to be a kind of a, a, a nakedness, a kind of admission that um, that mm-hmm. less fronting and an admission that I'm not, I haven't realized myself here yet. I'm, uh, I think I can do better work. Uh, I want to know myself better uh, and I need your help. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit more, uh, there's more vulnerability involved than just mm. being with other people who are like, I heard Serbian uses this on his snare. It's like, oh, whatever, bro. You know, um, that's just more lost people and, and literally gear studs is full of them, right? I don't want to so, know what he uses on his snare. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think it's more, it's fine, it's fine people, but then someone has to, someone has to, uh, you know, drop their guard first. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. maybe maybe the, um, in, 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 in such shark infested waters, that's, uh, that's funny, but I think consider what would it be like if I laid, you know, if I told people what I'm scared of in my work, uh, or you know, if I was vulnerable yep. in 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 with my with my peers? Yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't mean <laughs> knocking on the A and R at at uh, no, Electra's door and saying, "Listen, I think I don't think I've got the goods." You know, no, I mean, I, mean, I, I was <laughs> lu- I was lucky. <laughs> don't I'm do prob- that. I'm probably shit. No, <laughs> honestly, I think I, I can I can think of all the the examples that I gave in this conversation about when Michael brought up resistance and fear in the room. And uh, I would talk to Spider about them at night, or I would talk to Tyler Johnson about them on the way home from the studio. Um, 
we would discuss what happened in the room, how it made me feel, how I made the other person feel, and we would we would break it down. And it, I think that's what I was getting at with, I mean, we got to find people that we trust. Yeah, you can trust a lot of lost people. You're totally right. And um, I think there are, there's so many resources for in, for inspiring people out there if they're not, I guess if they're not in in your close um, group, I guess we have to find them mm-hmm. elsewhere, which we all do anyway. But I got I got lucky with with Spider and you know during that time in my uh, life. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I see the image of Michael stepping off the building a lot. In when you start talking, I I'm thinking of this these moments or this moment. Mm. Of course, it, there's many of them, but mm. I'm thinking of you jumping. And one of the one of the approaches to that I've used over the years to encouraging people to jump is to fully wrap their heads around. I had this with with a friend a couple of years ago who was going through a really hard time, you know, really, really difficult time on every level and um, and was really struggling with his relationship with the music business and former success and, and you know, current struggles and mm. family. The whole, everything was in the mix. Really, really gnarly situation. And for me, uh, one way of looking at it was, are you cool with working at Starbucks? You know, like, are you cool with, is that, is that something you're terrified of? Is something you would feel ashamed about? Um, I've got two kids and a wife. I'd happily work at Starbucks to pay the bills, right? I would be happy and lucky to work at a Starbucks. Um, that is maybe in my case, the worst case scenario. That's as bad as it gets if, I, if the wings don't work. Like I put myself out there. I don't do PMC. I, um, I, I don't fly. Fuck up, hit the pavement. Uh, all right, dust myself off. I'm off to Starbucks, guys. Like I'm, I'm, I live in a city where Starbucks is hiring. Not right now, obviously. Uh, I'm, I, I, I could figure out how to push that button on the machine. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I'm trainable. So the point is to embrace the worst case scenario. A lot of times we're, we're trepidatious about making a move. Um, and the, the worst case scenario is not actually that bad at all. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and, and of course, the longer you spend on the ledge, mm. the, the, the bigger it gets in your mind. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, mm. what my dad think if I, <laughs> what, he doesn't give a fuck, pay your bills, you know, <laughs> and Gary Vee has been great on this, you know, um, someone, someone that I follow, you know, he talks yeah. about it a lot, but this, this kind of just, you know, embrace the worst case scenario. What about it? Yeah. And then take the risk. Yeah. Talk and, through the consequences. Yeah. Cause often yeah. they're not anywhere near and you know for my friend in that case it was helpful and he and mm-hmm. just last week we were talking and he brought it up as kind of like it was it helped him get unstuck because of previous achievements mm-hmm. he felt that any move in that moment was leading him to less than mm-hmm. where he had been and that he was somehow on some downward trajectory and i'm like okay so let's look at what the bottom looks like mm-hmm. you're in a good relationship you're you've got your physical health and you're working at starbucks that seems like a great place to build a life from to me you know? Oh, well, that, that was my thing earlier when I asked if there's a time limit. Um, oh, yeah. And I, you know, we didn't really talk about it. And I don't know if there is anything to talk about with it. But at a certain point, at least have the conversation with yourself and maybe some, a clo- again, the close homie or something like, what does the worst look like? Like, is that really that bad? I mean, I, honestly, I was laughing um, when you were talking because I was just imagining you... <laughs> as a barista and I can see it. And that's what scared me. It was like, I know, cause I know your actual, your, your, your true deepest potential and just seeing you. I'm not a even more barkeep mode, but no, I, I think about, Rory no, but just thinking, but, the thinking green about apron. Rory. No, no, yeah, it's a little more bar. Rory's like, yeah, I only do black coffee. I don't even do lattes. Like yeah. you just say no. You yeah. just like nah, I don't do that. And I'm just I don't do expressing dairy. my vitriol on the cups through their but, names, just fucking everyone's name. Specializing. But what <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying that people. I'm, I'm trying not to say that uh, anybody can give up. Um, it's that it might be worth having a conversation with yourself, saying, "Is this really what I want to do? And have I put the best foot forward each and every time?" Um, where did I miss and, and try to ask these harder questions um, at some point. I don't know when it is. I just imagine there's a point when you have to ask it. If, you, if you're trying to build a family and you're trying to be a reliable member of society and you're just locked in the room smoking weed with zero output, mm-hmm. that's, you know, it just, um, you know. Yeah. And I don't it's, know. It's just a hard, well, it's there, a hard topic. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. They're suffering in service of 
a, a long term goal and they're suffering that's just fucking needless. Yeah. You know, um, beating yourself up about the records you're not making that aren't going anywhere, that aren't making you money, that won't hit, um, takes a toll. Yeah. Um, and you can be free of that and you can have a good life working at Starbucks. And I don't mean, I, I want to be very specific for all the people who are working at Starbucks and, and, and uh, I don't mean to paint that as some kind of diminished lack of potential. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a job with dignity where you can pay your bills. And if you want to build from there and be a manager and district manager or start playing in a garage band again at the weekend, whatever. Exactly. But there exactly. is, there is an, it's, it's a way of embracing failure, you know, in air quotes, um, not, you know, maybe failure isn't so bad because it's, it, it really is the time limit. It, it, yeah. it, it, it's where the, where you start on a new direction, a new path, because you didn't keep banging your head mm. against the, the brick wall that was mm -hmm. at the end of the road you thought you had to be on because mm -hmm. you, you left your hometown and said, I'm going to LA to make hit records. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because and also, you identify with that choice. Yes. Right. And yeah. also you can reframe failure to any other way. The pieces didn't fall uh, the way you wanted them to. It, it simply didn't work out or, I mean... To say failure is, seems totally, totally. Can, can be aggressive, right? I mean, yeah, it doesn't have I, to be framed that way necessarily. I, I had that conversation with my kid today. Yeah, mm. yeah, same, slightly simpler version, but not much. You know, you know? I mean, I'd love to have been a, a concert pianist virtuoso, and it just didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you're you're I'm a mix engineer now. <laughs> 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 Fucking failure, <laughs> deadbeat. Well, I failed at one thing, and I succeeded at another thing, totally. right? And so, you found your and voice. you're not you're not yeah. anywhere near done. The specialization thing, I think, is is one dimension in the self development path, and it's a thing that can be flexible. You know, there can be a time, I mean, people changing careers, much more routine than it used to be. These tracks are totally. as, as defined. You'll see scientists jumping fields entirely every, you know, every decade or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in it, it's the specialization is a kind of convergence uh, on a, and a narrowing of your options. Um, mm -hmm. But that can be opened up at any moment. And that's all a negotiation, I think, it can just, you can go into an exploratory frame of mind about how you're spending every day, yep. you know, at any moment in your life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I really yeah. like that. Can we, can we end maybe on a question? Sure. For everyone at the table, you know, what is this, what is the, the edge for you right now? What is the decision you're trying to make in terms of specializing more or focusing? What, you know, it, as as the conversation the, we just had, your frontier of your your uh, current frontier of, of 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 that you want to leap from, or that uh, something that is there one? Are we talking? Uh, we're talking career wise specifically for this. Your call. Yeah, mm, we should we should yeah. specify. Um, yeah, let's say let's say work wise, career wise. I want to hear from Michael. That's well, I'm looking at Michael yeah. to see what he's got <laughs> because uh, mostly because I painted him as this. Mm bird on a ledge all evening and it's like it probably is ridiculously well, out, brand, out of we touch. Were, brand strategist was a term we were using a lot mm. um, last year when we first started talking about this role you were playing for specific clients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean... That doesn't fit anymore. I think it still sticks. I think there's specialization in that. Mm. <laughs> so it's like... A subset of brand... Yeah, strategist. yeah. Like, what yeah. part of the, what part of the strategy are you contributing to, and um, sort of how zoomed in um, versus zoomed down am I? Like, how hands on am I with the work? To what level? Rather than that, leadership. Yeah, yeah, I think that's sort of the mm -hmm. area right now that I've been looking at. It's mm. just, um, you know, uh, how zoomed in am I, and how zoomed in can you really be, and be zoomed out uh, uh, having a title branch strategist is already suggesting zoomed out so then doing work that's zoomed in is just more context switching that mm. isn't that has a cost mm. yeah it's it's a known cost i mean i knew that it would be the case but it's sort of the uh, flywheel that will help me then get to a level where i can be more zoomed out Mm. kind of have to do both so the the goal is to be zoomed out ultimately you'd like to not put your hands on the computer i mean I'll always touch a computer, but <laughs> yeah, for from a, for the not. I mean, 
actively designing the the particular piece of, of yeah art. like the the artifact specific moment can be handled by anyone that's good mm. at it you mm. know if, if you've um, done your job effectively upstream. yeah yeah and i, mean, I think powerful. you know in terms yeah. of advising people on on you know oh yeah it, it's definitely needs to be a circle like that's been worked out or whatever it is <laughs> i don't know you know like there's there it gets to a point where it becomes super tactical um and to be strategic and tactical back and forth yeah. week over week conversation to conversation throughout the day. It's just, <laughs> it's so much that um, I just don't, I don't think the energy being spent at two completely different poles is um, healthy in the long term. Yes. In the short term, it's a, it's a cost of of growing, you know, of growth. Yeah. So the so mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the the broader picture. But for you, your you feel a tension so between being being you know putting your hands on the work one on one, working with people, and your longer term vision to be to be sort of someone with more of an overview, more of the thirty thousand feet sort of perspective on the brand, on the mm -hmm. the output, right. Yeah. Cool. And then working with maybe one to three people of like that are hands on on the work, and maybe one of those three are kind of in between the two, and relaying so people strategic who, and who would benefit tactical. from the synergy of having a guidance and leadership yeah. like yours. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. That's awesome. With uh, upward mobility built in. Mm -hmm. to the, yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Spider. What. My question. Your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. When, pe when people talk. Slippery, right? No, yeah, but when <laughs> people talk, um, it's, especially you guys, it's highly stimulating. <laughs> and my mind goes in, in all kinds of interesting directions. Mm. Share, share with us. <laughs> um, where did it go? Bring us on this You can journey. give up on your answer the question and just yeah, go somewhere else. Totally. <laughs> the question is not that great, honestly. So just fucking... I don't even have an answer for uh, it. No, actually, I mean, this is the no. grand... This is my grand question. Yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah exactly. You know, producer of what? You mm. know, it's like a... It's vague terminology to begin with. Um, I like producer of what question mark as the title. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's like, producer what? Of what? What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I'll produce it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's kind of right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like like I said, Apple has a role called producer. It's a, it's a real role. Mm. It's a thing. I mean, yeah. not just Apple, like a lot of companies. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it seems like a leadership produced. role. Yeah, it's yeah. a leadership role. I mean, or a, a, of or strategic. I mean, yeah. like leadership is a tricky one because there's so much to that too. But it's a strategic role, and mm. it seems like a role that you're very comfortable being in. Mixers yeah. could be produced. Engineers could be produced. Lives. Yeah. 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 Lives. Yeah. Weddings. We've, I mean, like yeah. events. Uh, Design so standards. Manuals we've pushed can be more. Produced. Yeah. More. We, we've tried a lot of words on for you, and we keep coming back to the word spider. What you're doing is is more than just producing. You know, there's a there's and it's it's certainly more than kind of strategy and management because there's a there's this antenna into the world that, that's that's so sensitive for the moment and the zeitgeist and the, and the energy in the room and the history of whatever the topic is that we're that we're digging into so you know yeah i'm just uh, often i'm just i come back to spider yeah you know one of the things i was because john in the first episode introduced himself and then we started introducing mm -hmm. michael and the mm -hmm. conversation kind of went like this mm -hmm. and in, it's we didn't finish that process and i was yeah. like you know, I, I mean, I thought it was awesome and interesting, but the, I thought that we, like if three of us, it, instead of introducing ourselves, we have the other three introduce the one. Ooh. Mm. Yeah. Good. Mm. And, and rotate that around. Yeah. Um, and that process in a way is an explicit version of the feedback you get about you know, to help you find your voice. The cooperation we so talked it about. it seemed like yeah. a pretty fun exercise. I love that. And you could mm -hmm. do it again in a year and like 10 love years. It. Or like, it's kind of a funny, mm -hmm. it's that elevator yeah. p pitch about, you're, you're trying to get to that in a way. Like, yeah. I give it to people about you guys or all at the least, time. Or yeah. at least have, you know, better descriptions. Mm -hmm. I don't remember your question. <laughs> 
It was so, a what are your front the frontiers yeah, of specialization? I mean, for me, the, it mm. is the grand question. Oh, okay. I yeah. think you you probably covered a lot of it in your answers earlier, yeah. which is this kind of. I think it's ongoing. I yeah, think I'm doing mm-hmm. it. I think I made the decision to do it, and now I'm just mm-hmm. doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll never know if I get there. You're not at a, at a road between the kind of work you do and and doing hair metal records. It's not that we're not at, we're not at that uh, crossroads. I, I, I mean, there are some no. technical frontiers that are being considered. Mm-hmm, I was going to mm. say that. Yeah. yeah. Um. I don't know if I'm going to actually say that here yet. But what I was thinking when you said it, like hair metal, um, I'm not solely existing in the genre that I feel uh, that I best contribute to. Yes. Um. Most of the time. Um. So that would be something that I am saying I'm working towards with my manager to um, mm-hmm. just kind of going more down a different path. Yeah. Um, Specialize a little more, make sure that, yeah. That makes but, but still, I would say that I'm still a, a specializing in popular music. So yeah. that's, and that's what I mix so all the time. So this is a so. subtle divergence from the, from the, the core lane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just subtle. Yeah. Or a convergence on a specific, on a specific <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I, I mean, mean, I yeah. it's jumping lanes. We're we talking about jumping lanes. No, I mean it's it's a lane that I have done and and mm. I I did. I mean, my most successful songs are in R and B and hip hop, mm. and I still get hired to do more down the middle pop, and that's oh, not. I see. That's mm-hmm. that's see. so it's it's just okay. a little bit outside. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, not a big. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I wouldn't, trying, yeah. I wouldn't want to alienate myself from the more down the middle pop. Like I, mm-hmm. I loved mixing Selena Gomez record. Like I had right. a lot of fun doing yeah, it yeah, for sure. OG and Volta. Like I want to mix for them all the time. But when I talked to uh, Raul about this, he's like, "Yeah, me too, man." You know, we're like on the same page too. <laughs> so, um, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I don't really have a clean answer to that. No, so uh, I think yeah, that's I, a, yeah. we've explored it. It was cool. Yeah, yeah, and a cookbook. Yes. Yeah, sh- and the cookbook. Should we announce it? Is that correct? I got so I, we just did. I started writing this cookbook um, or creating this cookbook oh. and then I got busy again right after those kind of two weeks that mm. felt a little mm. bit quieter where I was doing like a mix a day and then I would work on this cookbook and I got a little busy. Uh, I do have a bunch of recipes and I have the intro written. Um, just got to figure out how to format it. But it will happen. If only you knew a guy who could help you format a book. I know. If only... I know. The great formatter they called me. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to illustrate it too. He wants to that leap, might be too much, leap off that building be and too much work. fly and format for everyone. illustrate it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I had a really good time with you tonight. Yeah, yeah. this was great. Um, Thank you. And thanks to Uli Stein for the wine. Woof. Yep. I feel like just hearing you say I had a really great time with you tonight, I'm like, is this the end of the date? <laughs> We're going back to your place? <laughs> is this We're at my end? place. Yeah. We're at my place. Oh, your dates end like this? Do you guys want to stay? <laughs> you did just dim the lights. So. <laughs> you don't, don't, don't want to stay? <laughs> peace. Bye. Yeah, peace. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Spider, I made you a logo. The new spider. What is it? Is it a spider? This little spider with the oh, checkerboard. Yeah. Checkerboard. <laughs> checkerboard. That was fun. This episode of Conversations was recorded by Rory O'Flattery and mixed by Dylan Seals.